Mr. Hilla, uh, explain the circumstances of your joining the service. What was that about? Well, that was during the Depression years, you know. And there was nothing much to do at all, so I told my mother, I'm going to go join the U.S. Navy. It was okay. This was a war coming. She knew there was a war coming out. It already, it already started in 39 in LA, so it was okay for everyone, you know. So I went to the federal building in St. Cloud and waited there for a good hour, hour and a half. Nobody showed up, so I turned around, walked around the corner, and 15 minutes later, I said, I do, to the U.S. Army. But it was just, uh, there was nothing for us to do at all. We worked probably work all day somewhere for a dollar a day. Like I worked in the dairy farm from four o'clock in the morning till eight at night for a buck a day. Is that right? So I had to. Uh, Did quite a number of your friends do that too? Do what? Quite a number of your friends joined the service at that time too? No, I was about the only one from the area that I know of. So you were in the army then for for, uh, oh, just almost two years before the war started. Would you tell me about your experiences in the peacetime army, what you did and where you were? Well, the peacetime army is a hell of a lot different than it is right now, I'll guarantee you, because while these were, like our drill sergeants, they were professional soldiers. And uh, discipline was very tough. And if they told you to do something, you had better do it or else. Like my uh, first sergeant was a big barrel chested guy. He was a Greek. Uh, he used to scare the hell out of us. Mm. Just when he walked in and talked to us, he had a real gruff voice. And there was no nothing turning back from that guy. If he said something, you had better do it. If he told you to squat and go potty, you better try, and he told you what color you had better try that color mm. too. Because he, he was mean, he was vicious. But I was disciplined in those days. Today they don't have that anymore. You, um, I understand, went to uh, Coast Artillery, right? Is that was your first? Yeah, I went there from from uh, Saint Cloud. They they sent me over to San Francisco or Fort Berry, which is outside of San Francisco. I, they put me in the Coast Artillery the anti aircraft. And I got my basic there, there again. But the basic was real tough. You had to. We lived in tents and we had to be clean. And boy, I'll tell you, they were tough. They checked your bunks, everything. If a quarter didn't bounce, your blanket had to be tough. If a quarter didn't bounce, you got gigged. But uh, all in all, Basic wasn't all too bad. We had a corporal there that was in charge of us. He was, wasn't a too bad of a guy. His name is Corporal Richter. I'll never forget that man. He taught us a lot, you know, about the service. He talked to us, you know, what to expect and what to do. He was uh, probably had 14, 15 years in the service over And a corporal. And a corporal, yeah. Small in those days, <laughs> well, you didn't make sergeant until at least you had damn near 30 years in. They didn't, promotion didn't come easy. But anyway, um, it was the 65th Coast Artillery that we got put into. We had a lot of drill with anti-aircraft. Ours was basically anti-aircraft, not the heavy coast. We did have some training on heavy coast, which is 155s, outside of Fort Baker, but we never fired them or nothing, just you know, go through the drill of it. And they, um, our uh, and the aircraft at the time was composed of strictly 50 calibers and 30 calibers, you know. Were like these quads or duels or just single guns? Single, single. Yeah, that's all we had. We didn't have much. We knew there was a 37 millimeter coming out, but we never seen one until I got to Camp Gallon. Hmm. We were very ill prepared, ill prepared for that war. That all guarantee. Did you feel that you were at the time? The what? The service? Yeah, when you were in the service, did you? For me? Feel, yeah. Did you Absolutely. Feel that? But Absolutely. the equipment wasn't very good and things of that kind? Yeah, but it made you uh, do your own thing, you know. You know. I don't regret one day of it. Where were 
were you uh, at Pearl Harbor? In Pearl Harbor. When Pearl Harbor broke out, okay, I'll have to back up a little bit. After I left Fort Berry, then they transferred us to Camp Horn, which was a training center for the National Guardsmen coming in. It was just outside of Marchfield in Riverside, California. And um, the 217th, the 15th, 16th, and 17th National Guard come in, which is St. Cloud, was 217th. And I met a lot of my old buddies. I was an MP there. Put me on MP duty, and um, I rode a sheriff of Riverside County. Checking all the nightclubs and bars. The GIs, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And you must understand that the National Guard and the regular Army did not get along. Oh, is that right? And the National Guard was NGs, NGs. That's what they call it. Hey, you're NG, SOB. And then the <laughs> fight would start. Uh, we generally broke it up. Uh, like I say, I hauled in a few of my buddies from St. Cloud, the people that I knew. And. Uh, they used to haul them in the back door, in the back gate, because we brought them in the front gate. They had to be checked out and everything else, you know, arrest and all that. And we didn't want to get these guys in trouble. So one day the officer, they caught us bringing a whole load of St. Cloud boys in. Boy, that was it for me. <laughs> was all through the in and MP. So then they shipped me out to Camp Callan in California in the training cadre. There's another anti-aircraft group. And, uh, it was kind of fun. We opened up the camp, all oh, mud, mud up to your knees. Then they start bringing the trainees in. They're draftees, but we had to call them trainees. Started to shift a little bit. And um, and a friend of mine from South Rapids, his father passed away. And in the meantime, my wife, well, she's from Arvin, if you know where Arvin is. From where? Arvin. He's just outside of Holding Fort, a little bitty town. So uh, I said, why don't you stop over and see her? And by God, if he didn't bring her out there with him. So a couple of weeks later, we got married, and uh, we, I was making six, six dollars a month at the time, but we rented a complete furnished apartment overlooking the ocean. It was just beautiful. Complete for 25 bucks a month. And we got a commissary, you can buy food and stuff. Uh, we got laws. He got us up a little job there. It worked out real good. On December 7th, I was at home. We were having breakfast, and the news came over the radio that they bombed Pearl Harbor. All military personnel returned back to base. So we didn't have a car, so I went out the highway, Highway 101, and hitchhiked all the way in. <clears throat> Came into camp, and that place was a turmoil, believe me. Uh, they uh, had everybody come and draw helmets. We never wore helmets at all, little tin pots. Not the helmets they got nowadays, but the old dish bag type. And we also had new officers fresh out of OCS come in there. They were there for the same purpose, for training. This one was a supply room to help my guys draw their helmets and stuff. And the second lieutenant was sitting there in the corner crying all by himself. I said, sir, what's the matter with you? I'm scared. I can't get this damn helmet together. He couldn't get that one. He was so nervous he couldn't get that one screw in there to hold the lining to the thing. So I helped him out with that, and I kind of tried to calm him down. Hey, come on, let's go. We had to draw ammo and everything else and set up on the beach because there were reports of a Jap submarine out in the outskirts. I don't know, not too many people know about this, but the Japs did have a sub out there and they did shell Santa Barbara mm. that same night. So anyway, there we sit. We got our fifth, little 50 calibers out there. 30 caliber machine guns and Brownings. We had Browning automatic rifles and 30 odd sixes. We had three 37 millimeter anti-aircraft guns out there with about four rounds of ammo for each. Four rounds. Four rounds per gun. Now, then we had got, just got the new 90s in. That was sitting up there for practice purposes, you know, no ammo. We didn't even have one round of ammo for that, not one bit. And down the line uh, was the Coast Artillery with 155s, all they had. 
was sand filled shells, practice shells, just like throwing rocks at us up. There was nothing. We didn't have anything there. But the Japs could have come and short all we had was the 50 calibers and 30 that was working. And very little ammo for those. Very little. So this is why I was such a strong advocate, advocate of uh, good defense. Plenty of ammo, plenty of, you know. Because if they would have came, came ashore, they would have taken it. Was, um, uh, was Pearl Harbor a surprise to you? Ah, uh, yes, it was. We, we heard of rumors, you know, that they may attack, but we just passed it off our grain of salt like people did at Pearl Harbor. <coughs> but um, we knew there was something cooking. We're more worried about the Germans than we were Japanese at the time. But it was, it was a surprise. And like I say, uh, we talked about it. Hell, we'll have them with them in two weeks, you know, like they do right now in Saudi Arabia. The Gulf, rather. We will go have them with them in two weeks. It took us a long time for us to whip them. Were there any, uh, any Japanese-American civilians around where you were? Uh, no, there weren't any, but there were some to the north of us, around Los Angeles area. Now, there again, there's some controversy on it. I think I think you're going to work up to that anyway, but I'll tell you my feelings on that before you get started. We knew that there were spies in there, Japanese spies. Maybe not the average family, but there was always one in there, okay? How in the hell did they know where Santa Barbara was and what place to shell? They had a pretty, pretty good thing there, okay? They knew where all the fortifications were. They knew where everything was. Somebody squawked. Of course, when President Roosevelt, hey, we're going to round up these guys. FBI was involved in it. It's a sad thing that, you know, a lot of families, uh, wives and um, children got involved in that thing, but I still think that was the right thing to do because they were not to be trusted. Did you, you know, sense, uh, did you sense among your, well, within yourself and, and your friends uh, uh, a lot of anti-Japanese feeling right then? I mean, as far as... No, not right at the time. No. Mm -hmm. There wasn't, but after the, after the attack, then there was plenty of it. Plenty of it. So much of the rest of the time until you you went to flight school was in post uh, post defense duty. Pretty much. Yeah, well, training training people. You know, we I don't know how many groups I did run through, but it was it was kind of nice, but it gets boring. What were you doing, a lot of close order drill and things of that kind? Yeah, well, close order drill and gun practice and everything. I wish I had my the movies that I have. I wish I had would have picked those up. You could have seen, you could have seen because a lot of these were, you know, were taken during that time. Of course, no actual firing, but uh, one thing I will say, though, we did get a lot of people from <laughs> Kentucky and Alabama. They were dead-eye shots on the rifle range. If, if they had it, if they had a shoot the army away, they wouldn't hit nothing. Hmm. And the best thing on a long distance hike, take the shoes away from them. They'd make it. With shoes on, they'd never make it. You exactly. got to put a rock set up. So, <laughs> yeah. That was a kind of a standing joke around there. But as, as a rule, these people all turned out to be damn good soldiers. We did have a lot of Mexicans come in there and do our training academy. And some of these guys, People did not, could not speak English nor anything. And why in the hell they got him in there? And really, you could do, couldn't do anything with him, you know. They were illiterate. They didn't know the left from the right. And just, and I still think that a lot of these guys were probably smarter than we were. They come into service, so they had some good food and little clothes. A few of them turned out to be pretty damn good soldiers, but the majority of them were, yeah. were nothing. You couldn't, you know, depend on them to do something. Another thing, too, like you're talking about shortage of equipment. We used to practice shooting balloons, supposedly with a 50 caliber. An aircraft gun, okay, they'd release the balloons and anybody can shoot it, you know. Standing target, you open it up and let it go and watch your traces, but for practice, we used to tie a BB gun on it, side of the mount, and line up in it, have the uh, trainees line up in that balloon, 
and then pull the trigger on a BB gun. That's how bad the ammo situation was. They didn't have enough to practice with. Mm. So that's again why I say mm. we should have a, a guy give these guys enough stuff to practice with. What uh, what caused you to put in for uh, for flight training? Tell me about that. Mm -hmm. Well, like I say, you get pretty bored pushing a bunch of recruits around the area. I don't know, see these airplanes fly by. That was my pride and joy, God. I wish I could fly one of those things. And so then I talked to my wife. We talked about it. And finally, I said, if you like it, why don't you go? Okay, fine. The day before I left, my mother came in from Holding Ford, came out there, and I had to leave the next day, which is a, kind of a heartbreaker for me. But uh, as far as uh, going, I always wanted to fly anyway, you know, because uh, me as, a, as an instructor in any aircraft, we knew they couldn't hit a damn thing <laughs> they were like ours. <laughs> so that didn't scare me too much. <laughs> Was there, a, was there an effort on the part of the Army to recruit people like you, or did you just uh, just go to your CO and say, I want, I want to go to flight school? No, they uh, put, out a, put out a bulletin. They're looking for uh, pilots, because at this time, the Army Air Corps was building up, you know, that thing for the big deal. Okay, you were talking about uh, the circumstances of your enlisting in the in the Air Corps? Well, first of all, they, they sent a bulletin out, posted on anybody desiring to take the Air Force, Army Air Corps screening test to welcome and report to such and such a room. I the hell I want to try it. I only have an eighth grade education that scared the hell out of me because God, there are college grads up there, you know. And out of the 60 people that took that exam, the screening test, I was number two from the top. But then, let, let, let me ask you, what, what kinds of questions were they? What, uh, what kind of a test was it? They're basically common, uh, common horse sense mm -hmm. questions. Ah, there are a few, little, a few math questions and a few physics and stuff like that. But the majority of it was, you know, what would you do in this type of situation? What would you do this? There weren't too many. It was um, kind of interesting. And, and then to really get it, they give you a questionnaire, and you could take that home with you, study up with my wife. She's trying to teach me algebra <laughs> and physics, and she, you know, she knew a little bit about it, and God, and math. Oh my God, I went crazy there, I made up pretty good on that test again. So then, on December 2nd, I got my orders to go to Nashville, Tennessee for classification. There again, it was another doozer, but most of that was, uh, uh, Physical, the physical ability and coordination and things like that. Nothing, you know, as far as uh, math or algebra or geometry. There was very little of that. Like a penny arcade, you know, you would play the phonograph and then see it, you follow the record and all kinds, of, all kinds of stuff. It was interesting. Then they, uh, they took another test which uh, classified you as a bombardier, navigator, or a pilot. And luckily, I got my pilot. Do you have, you have any idea what, what criteria were used to decide who became a pilot and who became a bombardier? Uh, most of it was coordination. Coordination. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> if a guy was sharp in math, okay, or algebra, you know, you know, they, uh, they screen the particular mechanical mechanical stuff, mechanical ability, what, what makes a carburetor work, what fires a spark plug, you know, that kind of stuff. And they classified them into three, at least three different categories. Well, from there, two weeks later, I was back in Santa Ana, California, to pre-flight school. There was a dinger. Ah, they threw stuff at you, math, physics. You, you stayed up half the night studying this garbage. I made it through there okay. It was rough. It was damn rough. Was any of that stuff that was thrown at you any practical use in being a pilot or not? Not really. That's what I wanted. Not, not really. Mechanical Probably. stuff, yeah, but mm -hmm. not as far as uh, math and all that. Well, if you start studying aircraft, 
mentioned earlier, where you go up and, you know, what keeps it up and stuff, things like that, you know, you had a steady air force system, whatever affected what. But outside of that, there wasn't a hell of a lot of it. Let me ask you this. I was talking to a fella uh, up in Brainerd who went to flight school about the same time you do. He went from an armor outfit. And he told me, he says, I got out, I, I, I passed all my tests and got out. He said, because the instructors just treated us like animals. Was, was that your impression that you were treated badly as far as discipline, harassment, and all this kind of stuff is concerned? No, I can't say that. All of my, all of my instructors. Okay, were you harassed at all in your training? Absolutely not. You had a couple of hang, you know, if you goofed, well, you got it. But as a rule, our instructors were damn nice people, like in primary. Well, in, in pre-flight, that was, you know, they're the school teachers, what they were, but they never bothered us. Uh, possibly the most harassment we got would be from our upper, upperclassmen, which were a class ahead of us, you know, like the, like any other school, I suppose. We had a couple of line with those guys, but if you got to the officers, no, they were great. No problems at all with them. And uh, primary training, I got, he was a civilian, of course, civilian instructor. My God, we used to go up to his, he used to invite his flight to come to his house, you know, on weekends, and we spent a lot of time together. And we got along just beautifully. There were no problems whatsoever. As far as the military uh, involved in this uh, pre-flight thing, they were great. No problems. No problems at all. I don't know, maybe this guy here probably got into uh, kind of a hassle or something, or got probably got into a bad, bad outfit, but no, nah, there wasn't anything like that. Nothing. What, uh, what memories uh, or incidents uh, in, your, in your flight training experience really do you remember most vividly? For solo? That was something different. Look, that front cockpit looks pretty empty when you take off all by yourself, I'll <laughs> tell you. I saw that I think after six, eight hours, something like that. I don't know, but I'll tell you, when I hit the ground, I made a pretty beautiful landing and uh, taxied up to the, pick up the instructor and said, hey, Frank, that's pretty nice, pretty neat. You won't have any more problems. You want to take her up again? I said, why not? I went to a couple Went up for another 20 minutes or so. He sit there and watch me. Hey, you're a little bit lazy on that one roll there, you know. But uh, they were they were good. Hey, God, I can't see anything. Did you have any close calls in training or scary uh, incidents? Mm, no, outside of the plane and uh, took off in front of me. He was supposed to go and make a slow roll, and I was probably I don't know, a quarter of a mile away from something like that. And, he laid her on his back, and the instructor fell out, <laughs> <laughs> which was embarrassing for him, not to the student, because the student brought the plane down in good shape. <laughs> but he was so damn scared he couldn't even walk, because he lost his instructor. <laughs> oh, that instructor must have had a bad time when yeah, he got back to his He got it. He got it from us. Did he, uh, did he stick around? Was he there? Well, he, he was embarrassed because the truck had to go and pick him up. And he brought him in right to the flight line. <laughs> what a shoot, come back. <laughs> but he was a good egg. He, uh, you know, he took it a grain of salt. That was great. The wife was already, she was uh, with me in primary, which is made it, you know, made it kind of nice. But we couldn't get off the base at all in the evening. Just the weekends is about the only time we could go. Was there anything much, uh, much to do uh, for you and for you and your wife to do on weekends? I mean, oh, plenty. There was. Mm -hmm. So things weren't really shut down no, uh -uh. because of the war. Well, like Friday and Saturday, Saturday night, there you know there are places to go. There's uh, nightclubs or whatever. And then the instructor, he was good to us. And it was Sundays, we always went to church, of course, and then had to be back at the base for the parade on Sunday afternoon. But she had to go back to town. She had a little room, little apartment there, which was pretty nice. Were uh, 
uh, did, were there any um, any accidents that you witnessed during training? Mm, yeah, we had one student come in there. He come in a little bit hot with a PT-22, and they waved him off because he, his landing wasn't quite right. So he goosed the engine and he cartwheeled it down the down the runway. But he uh, he didn't get hurt or nothing. He just wrecked the airplane. So training wasn't particularly dangerous. No, oh, not really. Not at the edge of P's and Q's. Mostly, but well, half, half, damn near half of our class washed out. For what kinds of things? Well, like this guy wrecked the airplane, or bad, but just bad flying. You know. but it took him 15 hours to solo. Why they wouldn't? Hmm. It was eight, if you didn't solo in eight, eight hours or nine hours, then you could forget it. They washed out for various reasons too, like screwing up or. Not being able to long, get along with your buddies and stuff. What um, what's the difference? Is there is there a considerable difference when you go from the single engine trainers to the to the twin engine trainers? Is that is that a hard transition? Well, first you uh, you got to say when you leave primary training, you got a 165 horse Skinner in it, and then they put you in this like we uh, had the BT13, which is a, what they call a bulky vibrator. It was like getting out of an old Model T Ford into a Cadillac, you know. And the engine just purred so smooth, and we had a lot of night flights, you know, we had to take to. But that was a damn good airplane. That was at Bakersfield, and we used to fly quite a bit of night, night flying there already, and a little bit of formation. That was nice. There again, then the uh, military, we had military pilots, instructors there, which they were great. They were really great again, too. There was no chicken, no chicken stuff around there. Discipline was tough. You had to keep your bunks and everything. They were inspected every day. But if you, if you kept in line, you didn't have any problems. Then from there, okay, so, okay then we go to Stockton to, uh, to an engine aircraft. Uh, that's a lot different. You, uh, <coughs> your your uh, flying changes quite a bit. You got two wings in there instead of one, of course. And like on takeoff and stuff, you don't get that yaw that you get with a single. And uh, a lot easier to fly, really. You feel a little more confident because you got two wings instead of one. They they give you single engine landings and you know cut off one engine when you're flying. Mm -hmm. hey, what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. you know? But uh, there wasn't not all that much of a change. It was it was kind of nice. Do you think you, uh, in view of your training, do you think it really prepared you for what you were going to be doing? Well, I tried. Uh, you're talking like after I got no, out of the No, I mean, uh, by the time you ended training, do you think the training had really prepared you well for what you were going to be doing? I mean, in the service. In the service, yeah. Well. They run you through, I, I don't remember what the other was, 12 weeks or something like that. And in reality, we didn't get the training that we should have got. Especially when you get out of a twin engine like they put, I wanted A-20s, fly A-20s, you know, put them in a the snare. But the training was so fast because they needed pilots. But we didn't get the training in the four engine aircraft that we should have got. All that I knew, I knew how to fly the damn thing and how to land it. I did not know how to uh, fuel transfer, nothing, because it took you out of this, and you had six weeks here overseas. Hmm. And most of our training then was high altitude bombing practice. Bombing, some air to ground gunnery, and that's about it. Hmm. There was nothing about the operation, uh, how the aircraft works. Or hmm. I didn't, I wouldn't know how to be able to transfer fuel from one tank to the other. Yeah, the engineer do that. Hmm, I see. So uh, it wasn't the training wasn't that good. So all you really knew how to do was fly the plane. Fly right the here. plane and mm -hmm. lay the eggs and bring her back, and that was it. Bus driver. Now we could have we could have took about six months learning that aircraft. You know, we knew how to thing worked, but as far as uh, getting into the nitty-gritty of it, the maintenance or what, we didn't know nothing about it. We knew we had two spark plugs for each cylinder. We knew 
we wanted to land if we're in night cross country. We wanted to land in some strange town. We knew how to screw up those spark plugs because you lose so many RPM, you know, you can't fly. You got to settle down here. All you do is shut one mag off, <laughs> drop the RPM, and you know, land in this town and go uptown and celebrate. Hmm. It's been done. I see from my notes here that you. <clears throat> Uh, you went then to Tucson in the fall of 43, mm -hmm. and you picked up your crew, and then you apparently went to McCook for about a month. Nebraska? Mm -hmm. About a month, two months. I don't remember what the exact date we got there, but there, there again, that was a lot of night cross-country flying, high-altitude practice missions, you know. That's, that's where we actually got most of our training. Dropping bombs at 25,000 feet, practice bombs, of course, and air to ground gunnery, things like that. Formation mm -hmm. flying, a lot of formation flying. And uh, gunnery practice, we'd have to dip down to about 30, 40 feet above the ground, let the gunners try and hit a target on the ground. That was nothing. They didn't, we didn't have no tow, well, one, one day we had tow targets. They'd pull a tow target, you know, along the side of us, but that's not attacking us. It's just sitting there and it just, you mm -hmm. know. But again, the gunners didn't get the practice they should have received either. Tell me about uh, how, uh, when you picked up your crew, then you, you started training together for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about your crew. Did you get along pretty well right, right to begin with? Or? Well, we had one guy, a radio operator, which was... He, he didn't like officers, you know, but we made a Christian out of him in a hurry. Of course, we had, we had one officer do that. He thought he was God because he had bars, and that was not my idea because I was a GI before I got my bars, okay? And I used to get along fantastic with him, so did my pilot, and so did my navigator. You had to. We lived together, we flew together, we drank together, and we hoped we didn't have to die together. But we were, we were family, real tight, tight knit. In the air, when we were flying, they got an intercom, you know, and they, we never called anybody, sir, nothing. Hey, Bob, we can pray. Hey, Dick, you know, that was strictly first name basis. But on the flight line, if we had an inspection or something, yeah, okay, then they popped to, because we ordered. But after that, it was, it was family. You had to do it that way because each one depended on the other one. Did you know of crews uh, who just simply couldn't get along with each other? Or no, I'm saying, what I'm trying to ask is that the simply, you were lucky in having the right kind of, pers the right kind of personalities, mm -hmm. or was it just, you knew you were gonna have to get along together? Yeah, we knew we, knew we had to get along. Yeah. We had one guy there that the pilot thought he was uh, King Tut, you know. And boy, that, that crew didn't stay with him because they could transfer out any time they wanted. Is that right? Yep. They could request a transfer, and they'd be next mission. They'd be out. Hmm. They'd be on somebody else's crew. But no way. My, my crew stayed together because we did get along. Got along beautifully. And this bombardier, I thought he was King Tut, so we made a Christian on him in a hell of a hurry too. And we just took him aside and told him, "Hey, this is it. Hmm. You don't like it? Out." Um, can you tell me about your experience in your flight over? Now, you overseas, uh, which I've got here February 44, from Florida uh, through Brazil uh, into North Africa. Um, was that kind of fun, or was it just drudgery? You really want the real story. I want the real right? story. <laughs> you would never believe if I told you. <laughs> Okay, we took off from McCook, Nebraska, and it was, God, it was about 20 below zero. We had our leather flight suits on, of course. We didn't know where the hell we were going. You get up, and you open up your orders, you go to West Palm Beach, Florida, and boy, here we are in this goddamn, you know, as we wound up there wearing our shorts. And some Navy fighters on the way down, and they come in pretty tight. And uh, I told the crew, I said, hey, these guys are playing with us. We got on their frequency, and uh, the one guy, he said, hey, we got you. Oh, hell, we got you long before you even 
fired a shot, you know, and they come zooming around, hey, that's good practice, you know, the gunners, they, of course, they didn't fire, they were just tracking them. But, hell, we could have got all of them. And West Palm Beach, okay, we landed there, it was muggier than hell, and yeah, it was, oh, it was horrible. Well, we only stayed there overnight. We couldn't get uptown, nothing. Well, Over the two days we stayed there, yeah. We couldn't get uptown, we were restricted at base, okay? Well, from there, if I, memory serves me right, we went to Puerto Rico. Yeah, we had three days there. It was kind of neat, they had a nice officer's club, you know, and come and have a year and I, we decided we're going to get a, get some booze to take along overseas. So we went over to the officer's club and we got a case of Johnny Walker Red Label. Cost us 36 bucks. They're damn near that much per jug now. Mm -hmm. uh, there were 12 bottles in that thing. We took it back to our tent. Okay, you take three, and you take three, and we give a couple of, of our gunners. You know, put, put it in their B4 bags because you can fill it. And from there we went to. Yeah, that's correct. Because that British Guiana. British Guiana. We stayed one day over there. And that's where I met Polly Goddard. We had a good time there, played the slot machine and made myself 10 bucks. And the next day we took off for Fortaleza. We knew we were going to Africa by then. And so we wound up in Fortaleza. Things were very quiet there. I don't know if I got that right. British Guiana, Fortaleza, Brazil. Yeah, I think it is. It's been 40 some years here. Anyway, I don't remember how long we stayed over there, but it was so sweltering up and muggy and oh, it was horrible. Then we got our orders to take off at 5 o'clock <coughs> in the morning. And my navigator, he couldn't hit nothing in the States. They come from McCook, Nebraska, looking for Des Moines, Iowa. We went down, went down about 500 miles south of there, navigating. Started to sweat him up a little bit. But on the way to West Palm Beach, he hit it right in the button. And all the way down, he was right in the nose. So we took off with the car. We're about maybe an hour out to sea. Of course, we are also, remember, we were on submarine patrol, too, looking for subs. The German subs, that's what everybody got up. American defense. Excuse me, on that. just a minute. Were you were you flying in a squadron at this time? Or you were no, you, we flew singly. Singly, okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. We didn't fly as a group. You were all by yourself. So <laughs> this is the way, this is the funny part of the damn show. Is okay, Jerry. He had everything all plotted out when it's supposed to land in the car and all that stuff, and he's all nervous and excited. And well, we didn't much give. Jerry comes up and says, Frank, he says, you know what? I said, what now, Jerry? I could stand a good drink. God, no, hey, we got another eight, nine hours across. He says, better not. Well, pretty soon he come up, he had a couple of snorts taken out of it. Oh, hell, give me one, too, then. And we put the engineer in the front seat, in the pilot seat. Of course, it's on an on automatic pilot anyway, you know. We sit back there and play poker. <laughs> and uh, we killed just about the whole jug. And about an hour out of the car, the uh, engineer called us up. Hey, we should be getting there pretty soon. So we put the oxygen masks on. We landed it. Jerry missed that thing by three minutes. Three minutes. That's where we're unloading the damn airplane, putting our B-4 bags out. And one of the zippers broke in a B-4 bag and three jugs fell out in the rocks. Luckily, none of them got broke. <laughs> that was one of the funny things of it. That was strictly illegal, I imagine, bringing booze over, wasn't it? Or no. Did anyone really care? No, a lot of them tried to go over. Hmm. Our squadron commander, Christy, had two or three cases aboard. That didn't matter too much. Did you, uh, you went from, then, then you were at Marrakesh, and then Tunis, right, in North Africa? Yeah. Is there anything about 
being in North Africa that you especially remember seems significant to you? Well, in Marrakech, I don't know, we stayed there for about four or five days, if I remember correctly. We were late over there, because our airfield was in Middle Italy anyway, and they were just kind of, you know. But we stayed there, and we could get off the base, and where in the hell are you going to go to the town of Marrakech? Why? You couldn't speak French. You go up to the bar and they have a glass of wine. So a group of us decided, six of us decided one day we're going to go see what the hell the Cosba looks like. That was off limits, forbidden territory. We stayed in the hotel there. <laughs> and we got to this one bar on the outskirts of town. How the hell we got there, I don't know. But anyway, we got a hold of these cabbies, you know, with a horse and horse and buggy, and we had a couple of jugs of wine with them, our 45s. Well, I want to go to see, I want to go see the Cosba, you know, and tell you it was scary as hell. So he brought us into a place, hey, there's a good wine, nice girls in there, you know, nice girls. But God, he brought us to a cat house. Hmm. And plush rug is just beautiful inside, sweet smelling, perfume, God. Pretty soon the girls come. And we have nothing to do with them. Well, we paid them, I don't know. Just for the hell of it, he put on a dance for us. None of us had nothing to do with him. Anyway, we decided to go back. And the cabbie was sitting there waiting. Oh, he wants his money right now before he takes us. So a guy by the name of Van Aspirin, California, started yelling, MP, and the cabbie took off, left us. It was getting dark about this time. And this Cosba, the streets are about as Oh, maybe ten feet wide. And here's six airmen walking down that thing. Well, we walked two abreast, each one had a wine bottle, and we had a 45. All these Arabs, or whatever they were, and they were cooking, uh, roasting almonds and stuff. We walked, I'll bet you, for two hours. We were getting scared about this time. So finally, we got a hold of some little kid who spoke a little English. Wanted to get out. Well, how much? Well, so many lira or whatever francs it was. He took us out. He had us out in two minutes. We were walking right behind the damn gate. And here's the MP standing us. <laughs> he started laughing. Hey, did you guys have a good time in there? <laughs> he said, we're never so damn glad to get the hell out of there, I'll tell you. It was really something. You scared because you thought you were going to be attacked? or? Well, the Arabs, it was it was real scary. Mm -hmm. There's no lights in the streets. You just, you just walk in the dark. You could, uh, where you're going, you could tell by the fires they had roasting almonds or cooking something or whatever it was, you know. That was scarier than hell. That was no way we were going back in there again. I thought that MP was going to bust the gut when we come out of there. You must, you must have looked scared, huh? We were. <coughs> we were. We had a couple 45s with us anyway. It was rough. Well, from there we went to Tunis, and Tunis was uneventful. It was a nice town at the time. I got movies that I took in there. Uh, the only excitement we really had there was when we had to go back to Algiers one day to pick up some airplane parts. I told you about this one, didn't I? Mm. Yeah, okay. Had to go back to Algiers, pick up some airplane parts for some of our ships, because there was nothing to do. We, we flew bombing missions, you know, practice bombing missions and stuff like that. But uh, they sent us to Algiers to pick up some parts. We went there, we stayed overnight in a nice hotel, and there was nothing for us to do there, really. So in the morning, we start taxiing out to the end of the runway, and here comes a jeep across the field with three nurses in it. They're from Tunis, from the hospital in Tunis. They wanted to ride back, because they had to be back that noon. They asked if they could ride back with us. Sure, we don't have any shoots. You're welcome. We run to hell of a, we took off running to hell of a big rain squall. But uh, we didn't make it back, and my navigator, he's uh, talking to these gals. And these are American nurses. He was talking to these gals, and I said, yeah, you should like to have a party, get a squadron party over to your place. Yeah, yeah well, that'd be great. In fact, they invited us. Well, we don't know when they're going to be there, but it'll probably be on the Saturday, Saturday evening. But we'll come over, and we'll fly. We'll shoot off some red flares. You'll see those airplanes shooting flares. We'll be there that night. Okay. 
our executive officer, which was Captain Ray, he flew the ship with uh, Jerry in it, and we were up. We didn't fly over to the hospital. We stayed on the outskirts. But Captain Ray, he had to go right over to the hospital and shoot these flares off, you know. He got nailed 50 books fine for that. <laughs> and the cost says nothing. But uh, the squadron commander arranged to have a truck, a couple of trucks, you know. Went uptown and got a keg of Dago red wine. We parked it in front of the officers club there. They had a dance going that night, nice little band. But we danced. We couldn't walk in ourselves. The nurses had to bring us in one by one, so. These three gals, they brought it, you know, went out and got another guy come in back and forth. I was supposed to quit playing at one o'clock. You know, we gave the GIs, I don't know how many bucks we had. We keep on playing. We got to it five o'clock in the morning. In the meantime, we're looking for, you know, for cops and stuff. Like I told you the other day, that we swiped a 110 volt generator from some off that Jerry and I. We're running short of light bulbs, so we're looking for light bulbs, really. So uh, Jerry located a case of light bulbs. And I spotted a tin can up there, five gallons of medical alcohol. That was, was good stuff to drink. You could drink it. But you had to mix it to about one-tenth to uh, ten to one. So I copped that five-gallon tin of alcohol and threw that in the truck and come back. And I, I come back to it. <laughs> Hey, Major Mack, come here, I'm show you something. He said, where in the hell did you get that? That's medical alcohol, you can drink that stuff. I said, no, you can't. So he said, okay, <laughs> keep that in your tent. I don't want that in my office. <laughs> so everybody come around, they got a cup full of that stuff that would last for a whole week. Some of the things we pulled over there was really unfair. Okay, from North Africa, then you were based at what, Pantanella, is that right? Well, uh, Pantanella. Pantanella? Mm -hmm. Pantanella. <clears throat> that, was, that was your permanent base. That was our, yeah, the base we flew out of. That was about oh, 70 miles out of Barrie, west of Barrie. It was brand new. There wasn't enough landing strips there for everybody. So as some of the ships went over to Chardonnay to another base, but it all took the engineers not too long, you know, to build the runaways and put the matting down and everything. And this is when you, when you joined up with your first squadron then, when you got to, no, we got to Italy? we flew over as a squadron, as a group. As a group, we flew over as a group. This was our group headquarters. So what was, uh, what was it like living in Italy at the time that you did? Well, we lived in tents. It wasn't all plush. Some of the food was, you know, the GI food is like green eggs and stuff. But we uh, used to go and barter for eggs and stuff like that. We were cooking right in the, right in the tent. We had our own stove, you know, 50-gallon drums cut in half and then little shell casings for the chimney and use 100-octane gasoline to keep it warm. That sounds dangerous. It was. <laughs> you know, give us a damn. We let that long tube in there from the outside and let it drip in there. As long as the fire kept, it kept going, it wasn't bad. But the fire went out, the wind blew it out, and then the gasoline kept dripping. That was another can of worms. <laughs> the pilot, he lit one after the thing was out all night. The damn thing blew apart. Yeah, it kind of surprises me that, that, uh, that in the camp you'd have to provide your own your own heating facilities, if there wasn't anything there? There wasn't fun. anything, no. Hmm. <laughs> there wasn't, you got plenty of blankets and stuff, it was, you know, it could have kept them warm. And then, of course, you had to keep your pet warm, too. We had a squirrel monkey, and Jerry and I got in Africa. That little, oh, God, that was something different. You picked up a monkey in Africa? Monkey, yeah. He was a guy, that damn little thing. He'd, uh, he'd stay right to our tent. He wouldn't go anyplace else. Of course, we fed him. He liked uh, Hershey bars and... Anything. He'd eat. We gave him some, some bread one day soaked in booze. I think a monkey's funny when he's sober. You ought to see him when he's half plastered. <laughs> <laughs> we finally gave him away to another group, which is about a quarter of a 
a good half mile away from us. And that damn monkey came back to our tent. He was funny. Did you uh, have much contact with Italian civilians when you were there? Were they around very much? Uh, we had Italian civilians working on a base. Like in the kitchen and, you know, in the officer's club and stuff like that. Yeah, we had them there. And stuff started to disappear. These guys, when guys were out in missions, you know, they'd come in the tents and like boots and stuff and blankets. They'd, they'd raid it, you know, took them home. And we had one guy that always squawked on these guys. And he knew exactly in this little town where they live. And so that went up to the squadron commander told him, we know where the hell our stuff is. Shall we go get it? Is the ice, but you guys better arm yourself. Okay, so I went up and picked up a little Tommy gun and went over to this guy was with us. Went over to one of the gendarmes and told him we wanted this number so and so. They want to go over, we want to pick up our stuff. And God, we walked in this house and boy, these people of course were scared. They had every right to be too, because what we found in their house was canned food from our base. And they had Navy blankets, everything in there. Now, where the hell they got Navy blankets from? I don't know. We just took the whole damn thing. Black market. Yeah. Nice black market or either. They copped them. And he was, I think he was selling that stuff. Mm -hmm. Must have been. Because he yeah. had, they had everything in there. It was like a little storehouse. Did we clean up that whole damn thing? Took it all back with us. Was the uh, base near any town that you could go into, or R&R &R or anything? Or? Well, <clears throat> we used to go into Barrie quite a bit. Barrie was a pretty good-sized town. And how, how do you spell that? B-A-R-I. E-A-R-I. -E it was on the coast. And we used to be able to go down to the beach there and watch these Italians eat these raw fish, still living, just swooping down and go from hold. And, of course, we had our favorite places we used to go in for a glass of wine or whatever. They had a, a mess there where we could go and eat, you know, and uh, different national nationalities of people living there, uh, stationed around that area. So this one particular day, um, the neighbors, my uh, mother, Bombardier was with us, not my crew, but my buddy's crew. He was Jewish. Shock Myers, a good damn good bombardier too. And there were four or five of us walking down the street and run across a good looking gal, you know, with Poland, wearing a British uniform with Poland on her shirt sleeve. So I said, Yak to meet you, funny. She looks up at me and here's an American officer talking to her in Polish, you know. I think she dropped a clinker in the knickers. <laughs> then we kept on a conversation. The first thing she said, that other guy, he's Jewish. He's, he's a Jew. I said, certainly, he's Jewish. But I was in America, it doesn't mean anything. You're black or white, you're Jew or German or Italian, whatever. We're all the same. It don't make any difference. She couldn't quite understand that. Hmm. Then I found out she was a nurse in a hospital just outside of Barry, so she invited me to come up there. And on my next day, I wasn't flying. I just went over there. I asked for her. I got her and talked to a couple of Polish doctors there. And I'd like to see the see the patients. And what I seen going through that tent, you'd never believe these guys laying there with no arms, no legs, very little medical equipment, just nothing. These are the boys I took to Monte Cassino. Oh, boy. <clears throat> and that really struck me hard. Because I went up to each one of them. I talked to them. I told them I'd be back in a couple of days, you know. So I came back to the base and I told the guys about it. And eat some cigarettes and cartons of cigarettes for like 50 cents a carton, you know. Duty free and everything else. So I had probably had about ten cartons of cigarettes with me when I went over there. Yeah. You don't think I was a god when I walked in there and gave each one of these guys a package of American cigarettes. I had some chocolate bars too for the nurses, you know, and stuff. I was God. Then he invited me to come and have 
supper with, dinner with. All they had was boiled potatoes and boiled goddamn fish, no salt. Tasted like so much crap, but uh, I ate it. I was invited to come back any time I wanted to. There was one nurse that uh, I met, you know, and found out she was a nun. She was a Catholic sister. And we talked. And what I learned there was seeing what some people went through. It was fantastic. But I made several other trips back there after that, again, cigarettes and just loaded down and whatever I could scrounge, pick up like a little bit of canned goods and stuff. Brought it down there to them. But they thought I was God. Are you surprised they wouldn't be taken better care of when they were? And they had no medical supplies. Mm -hmm. British people just, you know. Well, they didn't have to tell them a lot either. Yeah. But these are the boys that took Monte Casino and got what I seen there. What I seen there. Colored bandages, you know, just rags. You know, Maybe it could have been some of my cousins, I don't know. Do you remember? Excuse me, there it was, you know. Just go around. One day. Another fellow and I were uptown, and we run into a Scotch Highlander. Yeah, he was a great big burly guy, you know, wore kilts in the whole damn show. Well, we had a couple of glasses of wine with him and some Italian whiskey, you know, that stuff was like rock good. Anyway, I'm getting a little hungry. Let's go down to the mess down here and get something. No, he said, I'll tell you what, let's do. Let's go get a rabbit. The guy don't stand to yourself, wrap it, and take it in this one cafe, he'll cook it up. And uh, he knew what he was doing. So anyway, we got this damn live rabbit, and we brought it into this cafe, and would you believe half an hour later, we had our rabbit? Half an hour. And this guy, the Scotchman, gets up. He knew what it was, it was a damn cat. <laughs> he just told the guy, got the guy to own the joint, and he said, tell me that's a rabbit, that's a cat. And he tell him by the legs, it's a cat. And they, they, they did this. They took the damn rabbit out the back door and resell it again, see? And they you a goddamn cat. <laughs> we didn't eat the damn thing. <laughs> but that guy sure raised hell. He was about six foot four and gaunt shoulders, you know, about six feet to three feet across. He was a mean-looking guy. He was a good egg, though, friendly. And, oh, there's so damn many things over there that happened. It's be nice to relive all of them. Do you remember your first bombing mission? Sure do. May 5th. Went over Yugoslavia. Was, before us was a milk run. All we did was just drop the bombs. The hell is not doesn't do it, you know. Then the second and the third one, and they started to get a little rougher. You know, we were all pretty much on the edge, you know. There were no fighters, no nothing. But we seen a little bit of anti aircraft, but there wasn't that much to bother us. On your first mission? Yeah. That was probably just sent out as a feeler for us, really, what it amounted to. A little small target. And but for, from there on, when she got rough, When you were, when you were flying on, uh, on what you considered, uh, you know, heavy missions, um, did you did you tend to to be scared of be afraid of, of flak and fighters about equally, or was was one did you consider one worse than the other? Well, the one I think they're both about the same because they you know that they're out to get you. Uh, sure, you're scared of them, right? You're scared. By the time you get out of that tent in the morning to go out to the, to the airplane line, you're scared already. Uh, and they all are, all were. Of course, there's a lot of BS going on in the intercom, you know, back and forth. Each one is trying to kind of, you know, calm the other guy down. That's the way they really worked. Uh, we'll get them SOB so they we'll knock the hell out of them, you know. And at the same time, hey, they're scared. I know they're scared. We were all scared. 
and it wouldn't be. Black was one thing, uh, the first baptism of Flack, and like I told you before, our anti-aircraft gunners couldn't get nothing, and didn't think the Germans could, but the Germans were right on. If they knew which target you're going to hit, they set up a, a box, what they call a box barrage. And they'd, they wouldn't shoot any particular target or any particular airplane. You just send you know, a bunch of stuff up there, and you had to fly through it. That was demoralizing as hell. Oh, I see. Because so you just, just a box of right. Right. Yes. You, you had to go I through see. it. You mm -hmm. had to go through it. And uh, that was, I think that was the worst. Fighters, you could kind of protect yourself against. You could shoot back, but black, there's nothing you could do. With the exception, and they come out with this window, the tinsel they used to throw out. I'd use a screw them up pretty, pretty good. But still, they, few, few, did, few did get through, though screw up their radar. Maybe some of those were, you know, like sound and like we had in the old days, prior before radar, but um, scared the hell out of me. One time it was so goddamn thick you could walk on it. Come back with 365 holes in the airplane and nobody hurt. Were you, uh, when you were briefed before a bombing mission, did they give you a pretty good idea what to expect? Mm -hmm. They'd always say, okay, avoid this area. There's heavy concentration of any aircraft, maybe 250 guns. I'm talking 250 guns. <coughs> the Germans had that 88. That was deadly accurate. It was a good gun. They tell you which uh, to avoid, but of course the Germans wouldn't move that stuff to no, they didn't sit in the place. They were pretty, pretty mobile. They didn't move that, and sure in hell, we'd run into those damn things. It was something different. The fighters, we didn't see, really, didn't, really didn't see too many fighters, because we had a, we had an escort, what, well, P-40, P-47s, P-38s, and P-51s. And they could go in as far as they dared, you know. They could only travel so far, and they had to turn back. And then we're, of course, we're on our own. But then he'd come back and meet us again. Another group would come up and meet us, They'd escort us back. The best ones I ever seen was that P Chuckertail P-51 group. There were colored boys flying that, and they were something different. Those guys didn't give a damn. They were good. They saved our eyes many a time. They were great. And of course the 38s weren't too shabby either. What was your, uh, well other than when you were shot down, did you have, uh, did you have quite a few tough missions where you got shot up pretty badly? Well, we never got shot up really too bad. One time the pilot got hit and also the navigator. One piece of flak, got both. And that was coming back from, I think, from Wiener Neustadt. Wiener Neustadt was a hot spot. That was death. That was a bad one. And uh, Molesti wasn't a milk run to nobody. Nobody. I had three runs over that damn thing. That was rough. Lots of flak or lots of fighters or both? Both. Both of them. Both. Munich was another bad one. Well, southern France was fairly easy. See, a lot of these missions, you've probably never seen a bit of flag or nothing, but somebody else got it. There never was such a thing as a milk run to everybody. Maybe we come in there as the first group hit it, and second group, they'd really probably get it. Mm -hmm. There's one particular time, there's one thing I, I can't quite figure out what in the hell happened. We're flying tail and Charlie down the number seven slot to the Lewis. You go, that's, that's Death Alley right there. And um, but nowhere near we're coming back from. My tail gun had a P-38 on their tail. They like, keep your eye on him as he's coming in closer. Oh, he's on our level. He's hanging in there. Then he dipped up and he said, that was a goddamn ME-210. Hmm. He come right into our group. 
I looked out the window. I could see him. He was that close. And all the guns were firing into him. They got him off now. I don't know what the other ME-210 was doing. And so close to us. We could see, we, we could see the pilot. It was that close. And I can't quite understand. We talked about it quite a few times. Uh, whether it was an American, stole it. Stole the German plane, trying to get back with us. But we don't know. But as a rule, if like a German aircraft would want to surrender, he'd drop his landing gear. That was a sign. Hey, oh, is that I'm how done. Mm -hmm. But this guy didn't drop his landing gear. Nothing. Mm. Then some people say he was flying our altitude. He got a little too close for the gunners. You know, radio the gunners on the ground. To set their time fuses on their shells. We didn't know. But if he'd have wanted to surrender, all he had to do was drop his landing gear, he wouldn't have been a shot fired. That's number one surrender. And they, uh, both sides, uh, <coughs> would honor that. So there I was. As a pilot, uh Are you, uh, as you're on a mission, uh, are you really aware of what's going on around you? We were talking the other day about, about the tension and concentration involved in flying formations. Uh, and you mentioned a couple minutes ago you were a jockey. Now, let's kind of put those two things together. And what, what, as a pilot, are you doing all the time? Simply looking at your instruments and... We're strictly flying the aeroplane. Okay, you've got eight other eyes, eight sets of eyes. They keep you informed of what's going on. Your job is to keep that thing as tight as you can. That's only it. Except on a bombing run, of course, and the, bomb uh, the bombardier takes the aircraft over. The lead bombardier does, and the rest of them, we always dropped our bombs on the lead one. Because he was, all the bombardier was, you know, just extra baggage. He called him a toggleer. All he'd throw the switch, he wouldn't even, you know. Unless it's a lead bombardier. Unless it's a lead bombardier. We, uh, we, just, we dropped our bombs on the lead one. Of course, they all were lined up on the target anyway, in case something should happen to the lead bombardier. <coughs> well, let, let me ask you this. Uh, okay, you're, you're in a formation, and I don't know, you're probably, what, a quarter of a mile from, from one end of the formation to the other? A quarter of a mile, hell, you're scattered all over the sky then. Wingtip to wingtip. So essentially, uh, as a squatter, you, you say you say you uh, you guide your bombs from the lead bombardier. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you? I don't understand exactly what that means because if you're on one of the tips and he drops mm -hmm. from the middle, are you doing area bombing then? Essentially, it'll be yeah, it'll be. I don't know what they'll even call it, block bombing or whatever. Mm -hmm. But we always dropped our bombs and lead bombardier, but every bombardier was also lined up, but he didn't switch the plane to automatic pilot. But he uh, he was lined up on the target in case the lead bombardier goofed. Then we'd all drop our bombs. Okay, like you get seven airplanes. I don't cover too much ground. Wing tip to wing tip, it's pretty tight. We get 112 feet wing spread. So you're not, uh, you're not scattered too far apart. Mm. Then the other squadron will be flying alongside of you, you know. So by all the pilot's doing, looking at, looking at his instrument, checking his distance from the other airplane. That's, that's all he's doing. Mm -hmm. He's a bus driver, glorified bus driver. And you've got other eyes looking out for, for uh, fighters and coming in or anything else. You know, you're concentrating on keeping that formation tight, and that's it. And the two pilots work, they've got to work together. Something like, okay, like um, we're flying from Wiener Neustadt and Ray got hit and the pilot got hit. I wouldn't have been on the stick. I could have collided. Hmm. Okay, you've got to be. So you, you got your hands right there all the time, no, too. Huh? You don't keep your feet off the throttle or keep your keep everything off until he says, okay, you go. You fly 20 minutes, you take off, back and forth. You didn't fly an aircraft more than 20 minutes apiece. You couldn't. Mm -hmm. At that time, I flew that damn thing, God, I don't know how long. I never was so damn pooped in my life. 
But we got her down okay. No problems. Tell me about the tell me about the day you were shot down. Which was on the thirtieth of June, as I remember, nineteen forty four. Mm -hmm. And you were on the way to Black Blackhammer. Blackhammer. There was the longest raid. Go to 15th Air Force. In fact, we're supposed to make a shuttle run into Russia and drop our bombs in Blickhammer and go to Russia and load up and come back again the following day. You said you had a, that several of your crew had a premonition about that day, huh? Oh, God, before we come up, I didn't want to fly that, that day for some ungodly reason. I never refused a flight, but a flight surgeon came up. I said, Doc, I got a case of diarrhea and I can't, I don't think I can fly today. Oh, you'll be okay. He gave me a pill, and okay, I took the damn pill, and then my engineer comes up to me. He says, Frank, he says, you know, I got a feeling something's going to happen today. I said, boom, yeah, you know, we've had these feelings before, you know, and then my tail gunner comes up. I don't want to fly today. And he's not a kid who didn't want to fly. Uh, we, everybody's pretty much on edge, you know, after three guys, and, and anyway, we did take off, and we get up over Hungary, run to the hell of a big cloud bank. We had a lieutenant colonel leading the group that day, which the big brass didn't get up too often. Would have been some captain or something up there, you know, somebody that flew. Constantly, why we wouldn't worry, but we were worried about this guy. Took us right in the cloud bank, and of course, he had a brake formation so you wouldn't collide with one another. We down here collided with another aircraft in the clouds, and we broke out of it. There they were, they're waiting for us, and I swore all the way through prison camp. I ever got a hold of that lieutenant colonel. So he didn't have to fly kill the cloud bank, he could have gone over it. We could have went over it or under it, it wasn't that thick. And it wasn't that long either, that wide. But how do you know once you get in there? But we could have gone over it or under it. Could have lost maybe two, three hundred feet of altitude. We went under it. And then they're waiting for us. Bunch of fighters. Scattered. Hmm. See the firepower of a squadron depends on how tight you're flying. If you got one airplane, you got ten guns. If you got se uh, seven airplanes, you feel tight. You got that many more guns to concentrate on. But uh, that's what really caused it. So you just couldn't support each other once you got out of them? There were six of them. Six of them jumped us, and I think we got two of them. And uh, we're trying to get away. We went to a, kind of a slight dive to pick up a little more speed. So we'd always went an airplane, which was about maybe half a mile away from us. We tried to get up to him so we have a little more firepower to work with. And I put it in the dive a little bit and goose the engines and drop the bombs, sell with the bombs. And, but uh, they got us first. I looked back and here the whole thing is all blazing. I hit the button, the bailout button. And um, Jerry was standing right behind me and the electrical system was out. Jerry was going to get up in the front end of the ship and tell the nose gunner and the bombardier to get the hell out. In the meantime, he got stuck in there. He couldn't get out. That's what he told me afterwards. And uh, we got out. I went out just before the damn thing blew up. In fact, my chute opened. I could see the parts of the plane for me. You went out through what, through the bomb bay? Or? I went out through the bomb bay. I went, there was the thing was like a blazing furnace in there. I tried to get out the top hatch and there was no way you could, I could have made it out of there. So I went out through the bomb bay. The bomb bay doors were open. And gasoline and hydraulic boots laying spraying all over the place. I free fell for I don't know how long. I think I passed out. I think I put my chute about 3,000 feet. And 
hell of a time getting that damn thing open. It looked in my hands and it was like bacon. All fried up, fried up my face and I was all burned. Hit the ground and busted my leg and went up to the guy making pay out in the field. I took my 45 out and I stripped it. Threw the parts away because 45 there wouldn't have done me any good anyway. He'd probably use it to kill you. There was no condition. Wait, were you told to do that to, when, when you landed? No, I did it give up own. or I did it on my own. On your own? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. there's no way. If you're armed, they get you. I was unarmed. Anyway, I started talking to this guy in English first, doing the no capisce, you know. And then I talked to him in Polish. He said, yeah, colega, colega, colega means your buddy. Went it down the line of the ways and pretty soon here comes a boxcar and a whole bunch of damn people. One of them had a gun that was 20 feet long and a whole <coughs> hole in the box, six inches across, pointed right at you. You didn't argue. They threw me in that box where it took me into this one place and I met the crew, what was left of it. Jerry was in there and his, his face was just a ball of black, just singed. His ears were burnt off, his nose. And I asked what happened to the other two, the two guys. And my engineer, my assistant engineer, said, oh, we tried to get Bob out of the ball turret. He said, all there was was a head of shoulders. We got a direct 20 millimeter hit, hit in the head. No one's going to earn that one. I, I don't know what happened there, but I think he was killed before he got out. Or if he did get out. So that's where I met the crew. When did you meet the Hungarian family? Or the ones who, who wrote that letter well, to you? Yeah. Well, from there they put us in a <coughs> wagon. And they dropped Jerry up and Jerry and I off at our first aid station, which they took good care of us. You had to set your leg and... They, uh, <coughs> well, they didn't care about the damn leg, the burns they took care of. And this was a German hospital? Or? This was Hungarian, Hungarian. Hungarian doctor. I had two watches, one in Minnesota time and the other one GI time. I got my escape kit. The escape kit always carried about $100, $150 in it with maps in the very area. They, they stripped you clean, except a picture of my wife. They took all my cigarettes. A picture of my wife. They left with me and my rosary. The rest of it, they took. And uh, they dressed me and Jerry there. And they, they walked us over to the hospital. We were for some time until Jerry died the 10th, 10th of July. But he was, it's much better that he did this. Oh, God. It's horrible. Did they, did they try to take good care of him, too? Yeah, they did the best they could. They addressed him and they used, I don't know what this purple stuff is, some sort of antiseptic for burns and kind of built a scab on it. Because he only took, he did everything he could for us, believe me. And the nurses, they were good. All good. But we were under lock and key all the time with a guard. But the honest told me it's not for us getting away. It's so people can't get at us. So, it's a real funny thing there, but on the third or fourth day we were in there, the uh, pilot had shot us down. He came to visit us. Hmm. First thing he did was salute us. And he tried to talk to us in Hungarian, but shit, you know, that's another language. You know, I couldn't make heads or tails. I tried to talk Polish to him, but it didn't. Nothing happened there. A little bit of German, I knew that didn't go either. But then his mother and his sister came in every day visit us. He used to bring us fruit, like raspberries and strawberries. He used to put it on the table and then he'd squash it and feed it to us. You know, the 
Hungarians were wonderful people there. We had a lot of good friends over there. What were the extent of your injuries, except besides your broken leg? Well, hands and face burned. I see. had a lot of basket surgery. My face was all burned up. Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. Cracked leg. But Jerry was... He was real rough. Then he went out of the center the last two days completely. And then he told me that he died. That was like, never, a person could never be that lonely in his life, ever, anywhere. It's, when your best friend passes away and you can't do a damn thing about it, it's just the feeling of loneliness being all alone. That. You know what's going to happen. Uncertainty of things. I found it remarkable in reading that letter. They said that they stood guard over you for... Yeah. What, what, what was that about? Well, this guy that wrote this letter was a surgeon, okay? Surgeon. Doctor. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he was a damn good one. I could talk to him in Polish. He understood a little bit of Czechoslovakian. And between that, hip, you know, we could talk back and forth, all right. And I t gave him my name and my address. And he said, I'll write to you after the war is over, which he did. I sent him parcels over there and to his nurse, to the nurse. He had a baby born just a couple of weeks apart from my oldest daughter. You know, I sent him a bunch of stuff over there, you know, like SMA, baby formula, diapers and baby clothes. And some tobacco for himself and a whole bunch of garbage, you know. And they're grateful people. The nurse was another can of worms. She, uh, I sent her a package too. And she had a family of four children. And they had a hell of an outbreak of polio. And she was wondering if I could, if she heard about the soft vaccine. Uh, when it was see Dr. Kelly here in Cold Spring, and I showed him the letter. He said, thank you, you're damn right. He said, I'll give it to you. So I air expressed it over there. He got it in four days. She had it. And then the letters, thank you letters, start coming back from there again. Now they told him was a hell of a person. And I showed you the other letter from Akron, mm -hmm. Ohio. And they had uprising in Hungary in 1956. I contacted the National Red Cross and also Red Cross, and I don't know how many phone calls, long distance phone calls I made, but it was a barrel of them. In case this man shows up, I sponsor him. I'll take him, you know, or Etrich. And there's, I'll take him. That job's lined up for him and everything. To no avail. And the commies took over there. Remember, this guy was a surgeon now. He wouldn't join the Communist Party. They took his job away. They made a janitor out of him in the hospital. That didn't mean nothing if there was a doctor or not. He refused to become a communist. He <coughs> took his license and everything away. Well. <coughs> Our government may not be the most perfect one, but I'll tell you, it's the best there is. Mm -hmm. I agree. I find it kind of strange, I guess, that, that uh, at least literally, Hungarians were our enemies, were they not? Was they were taken, no, they weren't. It was taken over by the Germans, okay. So there was no love lost between the Hungarians and the Germans? No way. They, uh, of course, they had their own people in there, too, you know. Uh, but this Janusz took, he was anti-Nazi. Boy, I'll tell you, but he'd swear at him and everything else. Just, uh, well, most of the Hungarians, and I had other Hungarian visitors come in there, you know, and they all went the same way. Um, the funniest part, you'll have to excuse me, I've got to go again. Funny. Yeah, in this Hungarian hospital I was in, one day there was a crew of five men that came in. They are cleaning up the hallways, and they got in my room. They're scrubbing away and, you know, 
cleaning up the floor and everything. And they were talking Polish, among, Polish amongst themselves. Well, I wonder what the hell. I understood every word they said. I wonder what the hell these Polacks are doing over here in Hungary. One of them finally come up to me and he used to ask me something and tried to talk English to me. I didn't understand and shook my head. No, no. Finally he got a little, after five minutes of that, he went back to the other guys and said, yeah, he said, I wish I could make them understand a little bit because we've been trying to get them out of here. I was only 35 kilometers out of Yugoslavia. Hey, maybe this is my way out of this damn place, okay? So I said, God, I wish I could make them understand. I kind of hunched up in my elbows, and I told him, ask him in Polish, why don't you talk Polish to me, then I might understand you. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, they're gaga, you know? And like old home week, they found out, God, they're talking where they're from and everything else. And they're conscript laborers brought in there by the Germans from Poland to do chores. They didn't get paid for it or nothing, just for mm -hmm. existence, you know. But that was uh, really something. So then, answer the horn, Ma. Is that on? That's okay. Uh, when are worry. Okay, you were talking about the Polish conscripts. That oh, was yeah. where we ended. <clears throat> well, from there I went to a back to the military hospital but had a Czech guard. What's that now? A Czechoslovak. He was a guard. He was my guard. The Czechoslovak. Well, she was drafted into the German army, okay. And uh, he felt real bad that I was leaving because he had to go, he told me he was going to go to the Russian front. He said, if I'm not coming back, I know I'm going to get killed. So he gave me all the coins he had, the pingas, and told me to keep them souvenir or something and spend them whatever I wanted. So the next day I was on a train and stopped at Lake Ballot on some joint. And the guard I had there, he was a pretty decent sort of a guy. Riding in a compartment in that damn train with everybody eyeballing you, you know, if they're getting knifed or what, you know. That was so it was just you and a guard? That was the yeah, hmm. that was us, just two of us. Well, he took me into a pub. We had a couple of warm beers, you know. It was a good beer, too. And then I wound up in Stalag Luft III. It wasn't exciting at all, that whole trip. Then I met some of my old buddies and got assigned to a room with some old friends. It took a while to get acquainted with their proceedings, how they saved everything and all. That didn't take, didn't take it too long to catch on. How they saved everything? What? Well, any bits of food, like potato peelings, he didn't throw those out. He fried them up. They do now anyway, you saw it was a special treat. But, uh, that'll make stuff. Hey, Ma, where's my pair of socks? In there? Oh, my gosh. Well, I've got some of my PW uniform yet. I saved certain parts of it. Uh, the jacket, the limey jacket and stuff. But uh, there you learn how to cook and make stuff out of powdered milk and margarine and sugar. You had to mix that together, you had whipped cream, right? And we made what we call like the Doin cake, which was come in the Red Cross food parcel, these crackers, and grind them up and dry them and then use, uh, make a cake out of it. Baking powder, which was pike and pay tooth powder, by the way. We use that for like, baking powder and sugar and stuff. That was was good. If you washed it, you could you could eat. As long as you got your food, full food parcels. From the Red Cross. From the Red Cross. <laughs> right. That's why, uh, like I say, why people don't, POWs don't support the Red Cross anymore. They do it's beyond my comprehension because mm -hmm. they saved us. They saved us. They kept us from starving to death. And, of course, that little bit from home. Cigarettes and the chocolate bars. And we got one package a week. You wouldn't start when you live pretty good. All the canned goods like spam and stuff like that. The Germans would punch holes in it, mm -hmm. open a can, so you couldn't save it. But this was part of the Red Cross parcel, the spam and things of this kind. Yeah, camp. right. Mm -hmm. 
depends some liver pate and all that meat, those meat products like beans and stuff, all those cans are always punched so that we couldn't use them for escape, we couldn't store them up, you know, you had to eat them, them right away. But the, but the crackers and prunes and raisins and sugar and tea and the coffee and stuff, that was all saved. Uh, you know, and pretty soon you got a big supply of raisins and prunes and sugar. So we get to work with this side hell make some wine out of that stuff. It was pretty potent. And I hope, always had a kettle of that stuff booming in back there. The Americans were pretty... They always knew what they was doing. We knew every day what was going on in the war. And that group of Americans was always somebody that knows how to make something, you know, like we had, we had a radio. And some of the parts, I suppose, they bribed the German guards, give them a couple of cigarettes for it, they bring the party in and stuff, and wire to make coils and stuff. So we got the BBC news every day. Hmm. Picked up, nobody knew who, who the hell had the radio, because the guy that had the radio, he'd give that to somebody else. Through, he wouldn't give it to him personally. He'd put it someplace. Okay, that guy would pick it up and do the same damn thing. So nobody knew, who, they couldn't trace, you know, where the radio was, otherwise I would, mm -hmm. that was certain death. No, it was the death penalty have a radio then? It was. And uh, we got the BBC news, and putting that and together with the German news, you know, you, you could pretty well tell. In the evening, why, we'd have some people standing out the window, the guy come in, give you the news. It was something that he could eat, put it in his mouth and swallow it if he had to. And um, we, had, we got it every day, every day, but nobody knew when that was. Hmm. In fact, my own roommate, I found that he was little X, he was number two in that chain. I didn't, we didn't know that, hmm. not even grown roommates. Yet. But we got all this stuff, plus what the German guards did to us. We uh, tried to get along with the goons pretty well, you know. It wasn't like in Hogan's Heroes by no way, but we tried to get along with them. Here's a pair of socks that I knit. The knitting needles come from the barbed wire fence. And the wool come from a sweater. We got sweaters from the YMCA and Red Cross and stuff, and we, had, we could use the socks more than the sweaters. So uh, hmm. there's always somebody who knows how to do something, you know? It's the pair of socks that ain't it. Yeah, it looks professional. Yeah. It sure does. Double toes. I wore that and I felt damn march. Let's not have this on display of that thing. And somebody taught you how to how to knit, huh? Yeah, well, a bunch of you you don't know, you get a bunch of Americans together. You you never know what the hell you're gonna <laughs> what you what you're gonna have in there. We had a professional gambler. Yeah, he couldn't beat him with cards, no way. Well, yeah, a lot of miles on these babies. I haven't worn them since. They're nice and warm. I bet they are. Yeah. Uh, what were your living conditions like? In that? You said you had a roommate. Did you have separate rooms or for two, two or three people or what? We had 12 people to one room. 12 people to one room. Triple tier bunks. Had a little wood stove or coal stove. We used to get our coal, the coal we got in the wintertime, we used it very, very sparingly. Most of it was to cook up your meals, you know, whatever you had. Barley soup and things like that. To make a bake a cake, we had to we used to take tin cans apart, you know, and put them together with seams. There again, how the hell the guy can know how to make a, a suitcase even out of tin cans? This, the guys didn't know how to do that, and they passed it on. And um, coal was very important to us. Showers were ice cold. Not too many people took too many showers. Number one, there wasn't that much soap, little tiny bars of soap you got. It was, it was rich. 
drinking water was, we had plenty of that. You could go outside in the summertime and you know, walk around a perimeter. And we tried to get seeds into us, plant a garden. That never worked out. And that sand, nothing but sand. Couldn't grow anything in the kind of soil it was, huh? This, um, <coughs> now what the hell was that name of that story? The Great Escape? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I was Stolaglyph 3, but it was another compound. They had four compounds there. I was in South Compound. Okay, this took care of what the place in the North Compound. This has actually happened. Because we, uh, we were digging tunnels, too. And um, it was all sand there, and um, they'd come around looking for bed boards, you know. And you, well, originally when you got, got your bunk, there were bed boards. And the guys were sleeping on maybe two and three bed boards. They disappeared. Go in there, stuff them in the ceiling. In the attic, they tear those out, use it to shore up these holes. And the way they used to go down in there, and they had long socks inside of their pant legs. That's where you put the sand in, okay, that they took out. Fill those up, they'd go out there, and then where the guys were playing volleyball or something, they'd let a little rip cord and let the sand sift out from their pants leg. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. How many tons of sand had to be carried out that way? So, well, basically there wasn't a hell of a lot more, except Christmas Day we cracked open one of our raisin wine things and celebrating a little bit when a goon walked in, a German. What's his most uh, Christmas Eve? Have a drink. Drink a wine. Go. This is revolting. Revolt. Next. Finally he decided he should eat and try one once. That's all he needed. <laughs> Sit down and drink now. <laughs> or else. That was murder that night. Jesus. They, uh, we got him so damn plastered he couldn't walk. He took his clothes off, and threw them in the can, kicked them out bare naked. You never seen them after that. But then all the raisins and all the sugar stopped. They confiscated everything. Hmm. But it was fun while it lasted. And pretty soon the raisins and sugar come back again. We never did find out what happened to that guy. Well, uh, did the conditions vary from one pretty much from one uh, one camp to the next? Absolutely. Or they pretty, pretty, which was was the yeah. first one the the best one? Is that well, one? Well, Stalag Group Three was an officers' camp, and actually it was a propaganda camp. Okay, we wrote letters home. Hey, we're treated real great in here, you know, which we didn't write, but that's what they expected us mm -hmm. to do. All we could write in the letter was, hey, we're still alive. And, uh, you know, we're getting along fine. But then when we got into Springburg, into Stalag 7A, she was rougher than hell in there. Was this another officer's? Uh... No, no, this is what they brought towards the end of the war. They brought all of these people into this one camp. Uh, like, we, uh, we marched for two days and two nights. I don't know what the hell the name of the town was, if I remember correctly. It was Spremberg, and they put us in boxcars, and that thing was packed with people in it. There was no room for you to even sit down. We stood with very little water, and as far as going to the bathroom and stuff, everybody went in one corner, and the guys were sitting in it, you know, and they were standing in it, and just no way. We were never let out of those boxcars until we got to Mooseburg. And it was a mess colder than hell. And that was the most horrible trip. But compared to what the boys went through the Japanese, that was still a piece of cake. You were at uh, Stalaglyph 3 then for approximately how long? Oh, shit, when did I get in there in September? I think I got in there in September and we left there 29th of January. Yeah, about four, November, December. four months. Yeah, about four months there, yeah. Which wasn't all too bad. But then, you see the Air Force, they kicked up their bombing raids. 
and hit, hitting all these railroad marshalling yards, the Red Cross food parcels start to dwindle. You're on package, uh, one pack a week. You did pretty good, but then it, one pack for two men, and then it dropped down to one pack to four. Hmm. And then it was one to six. Hmm. And it got pretty, pretty chinzy. And this was at lift three? Yeah, part of it at lift three. Okay, then we got, got into Stalag 7A. We each got a parcel. But hey, this is great, you know, but there was no more after that. That was hmm. it. We probably got one after that, I don't remember. But I know it was damn near starvation rations. What did you get from the Germans? Well, from the Germans, we got potatoes, which are half rotten. We had got a hamburger once in a blue moon, which is probably a horse meat. We didn't care. It's, you could smell it, it stunk. Uh, blood sausage. I don't know what the hell that stuff was made of. You said nobody ate that. Nobody ate that stuff. <laughs> so you got mad at somebody, hey, you'd eat blood sausage, you know. <laughs> then we did get barley, pearl barley, which made pretty good soup. Uh, believe it or not, mineral water. Hmm. Gallons and gallons and gallons of mineral water. What the hell they, eat? I don't know. Outside of that, there wasn't a hell of a lot more. Oh, dehydrated sauerkraut, dried sauerkraut. We had sand in it. A few rutabagas once in a while, but that would be about the extent of it. Did you, did you get enough food from the Germans that you could have lived on without no. Red Cross parcels? No way. No way. No way. Mm -hmm. Not even in so Slostal, I lived three. Mm -hmm. And black bread, which was 50% sawdust, by the way. Mm -hmm. That stuff, bad bread wasn't good to eat unless it was two weeks old. Mm -hmm. Use that for a pillow, you could sit on a damn thing. It made good toast. We used to cut it about that thick, thin. Why did you have to wait for a couple of weeks before you ate it? It tasted like hell when it was fresh. Oh, I see. So it dried well, out a little bit. It dried out. Yeah. It was, wasn't too shabby. But um, another thing, okay, you got 12 guys, 12 guys to a room. One guy did a cooking. One guy did dividing, dividing the food. So each one gets his portion. And the way that worked. The guy dividing the food, he'd divide it, but he had the last choice, okay? In other words, if the slicer bed was a little bit, even a centimeter thicker than the other one, he'd get the skinny one. That's how close they watched it. Mm. it was Maybe there's five raisins. You'd have to take the one that's at four. Mm. He divided the food. It was very real tight that way. And nobody, nobody complained because we're all in the same boat. So there wasn't any example of any of these guys hoarding or taking too much for no themselves? Way. There was no possible way of doing mm -hmm. it. Just when the food was distributed, like to open up the part. If you got your own red cosmos, mm -hmm. yeah, that was yours. See. Well, they got skimpy like chocolate bar. That was, uh, boy, that was like money. You could buy anything but a chocolate bar. But there again, we had to divide one chocolate bar got it divided, got the last choice. So, it was pretty tight. Tell me about the, uh, about the organization among prisoners themselves. Was there, uh, I remember security. Remember in some of these movies, you got one guy who's mm -hmm. a security officer. Yeah. I mean, it was, is this actually true? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, tell, talk a little bit about that, that kind of organization. What, well, number one, like? your, your first man would be, I asked ranking officer, like we had a, we had a full colonel. His word was law. He was our officer. You know, it would be anyway, no matter where we were. But as far as security goes, remember I was telling you about the radio thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, the security was so tight on that that we knew where every German guard was all the time. If he's coming, okay, something's going on that we shouldn't have been doing in our barracks. There'd be guy in the, you know, guys in the window. Watch it. And or even across the aisle, he'd probably raise a flap on the, on the window or some sort of signal. We knew that the Russians were close. We knew that. Well, we, the hell, we could hear the guns already when he marches out. But, um, 
it's probably a good thing they moved us out because the sure still would have been taken by the Russians because some of our guys were still over there after the war was over. We got picked up in the eastern part and pulled up. We were in there for a long time. But our security in our camp was awful damn tight. We knew where every German guard was all the time. We knew his personality, his habits, what he'd be looking for. Where he was looking for that stuff. Contraband, you know. They didn't worry, they weren't fooling us one bit. They say you got a bunch of Americans together, what one doesn't think of, the other one does. And you say that was that was about the best best place to be was in Stalag Luft Three. Stalag Luft Three wasn't a bad camp. Just like no camp was good, let's put it that way, but it was it was better organized and not in other ones were. Were your sanitary facilities adequate? The what? Your sanitary facilities, your well, toilets and, well, I should say latrines and things of this kind? Yeah, well, they always had a honey wagon coming around, you know, to train them in the septic system. Well, yeah, I had a pit, very big pit toilet, you know. But each one, there was one in each, each one of the so-called barracks. And then, of course, they had a main one there where you went and took the showers. I was very limited. So, only so many people could take it every day, you know. You got B.O., quite a bit of B.O. around. I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Especially that no soap and stuff. Yeah. But they lived through it. And an amazing part of it, too, but all the POWs is the people, you know, that were there at a rough time during the Depression in the 30s. Like the poor families and the middle class, they fared the best. But you get people, you know, that are well-to-do, and they got their kids in there because he knew somebody in Congress or something like that. They're the ones that, that really suffer. They, right, you a lot of those guys didn't make it. Mm. They couldn't they couldn't take the pressure of being living in poverty or uh, degradation like, like we were. But uh, get the low-income families, the farmers, whatever, they got along. If they're along real good, because they knew how to get by with stuff, you know. Nothing was handed in a silver platter over there. Nothing. Did you uh, did you do any digging in the tunnels yourself? No, uh -uh. I never got in. What was your what was your physical condition like at this time? Well, it wasn't too bad because we we knew we had to exercise. You know, we we played volleyball and volleyball and baseball, softball, and. A lot of walking around the perimeter. But what about your wounds? How, how were they? Well, those of mine were pretty well healed up. They were pretty well healed, healed up. up by then, yeah. They, uh, when I left the interrogation center in Budapest, there, that was, they opened up on me and I called that damn SS son of a bitch. That was from the time you went to the, between the time you went to the hospital and then, and, and camp, went to yeah. camp. Oh, camp camp was about there. That. oh God. I come in there, of course, you know, there's a German officer sitting up there, and he wants to know, hey, uh, you look like you've been hurt pretty bad, Lieutenant, you yeah. not too bad. Good been worse. I remember the exact words, too. He says, what outfit are you from? My name is Frank de Hilla. See what has 757620, United States Army Air Force. Was it? He buttered you up. He gave me a cigarette, which is an old gold. Hmm. Well, I got up before I can send you to prison camp. Well, I let the Red Cross know where you are. I've got to know what outfit you're in. And what are you doing? What do you find? Nothing. Two hours of that stuff. You get the turret glow. What are you going to do? He's got you over the barrel. Well, I put me back in the cell again. And next day, call me out again. This time, there was a SS. And of all of us were your gear, right? Jesus. And we heard about the SS, you know. I think then some of the bitches were at me. After half an hour of really pushing it to me, I told him, you're going to take a piss up a goddamn rain pipe, you son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you nothing. And he burnt me on these little swaggers to security over the back. Whacked me a couple times, and they smarted, but I, I winched, but so then he hit me across the face, and my hands weren't 
I still had bandages on them. He hit them till he started to bleed. Nothing. No damn way, Jose. It just made me more arrogant than ever, I guess. Then he slammed me into solitary confinement, bread and water. I don't know how many days I stayed in there, but bread and water is all I got. That little window. I could look out there and every morning hear some chanting out there. So she's the Catholic priest or whatever it was, administrator taking some guy to get home. That happened every day. Hmm. In fact, there were three of them in one morning. I watched them hanging. He, me, next. But there again, these people had these uncanny, Americans had an uncanny way. So that they, a lot of Americans went through that interrogation center. They had aluminum cups they put to give you a bowl of soup with, and they inscribed their names on them, you know, and all that stuff, and the addresses. And God, here, here, here's one of my old buddies. His name is scratched on there. He scratched mine on it to pass it on. My biggest salvation there during the time when I had uh, confinement was my rosary. I said, kneel down and pray 50 rosary a day. I pray one in English, one in Polish, one in English, one in Polish. It sure took the load off of me, I'll tell you. There were no atheists in prison camp, I'll tell you. So after a while, they, they figured you'd had enough solitary confinement, and they finally sent you to a camp. Well, they, 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 couldn't, they knew they couldn't, wouldn't get nothing out of me. I had nothing to tell them about, they already didn't know anyway. He brought out a book. Take a look at it. Pick a name. Any name you want. Out of there. I suppose he's looking, you know, see if I could find one of the crew members. They open the damn thing up like that. You already had it. Kids high school, where you graduate, where you start high school, everything. Some of them you had the, the uh, group number he was in. Hmm. But most of that was just what the family name was. Hmm. I asked him, where do you get that? He said, you ever hear the fifth column? Hmm. That's where you got it. Hmm. It's really, that's like in that diary, you'll see it was my the first interrogation full of surprises, that was it. Oh, yeah, they had all this I just happened to run into cars. Yeah, Ludington, Michigan. <coughs> that's where he's from, my engineer. So. But they didn't have anything on you? I didn't, I didn't open it. That. You don't want to date. I'm going to see you curious, see what they know about. Mm. He told me to look for my name. Mm. I didn't look for it. Mm. I keep him guessing, you know. Well. From lift three, then you, this one you did the boxcar. What happened, what happened when you left lift three? What, uh, after after the boxcar situation. That was the boxcar situation? Then? Yeah, well, first we had two days and two nights in the road of walking. And uh, a bunch of them tried to break out. Six of them broke ranks and took off with the woods and they shot three of them. So that wouldn't be any, you know. Nobody got away. Nobody got away. Besides, if you did get away, where the hell do you go? Anyway, we got into uh, Stalag 7A and Goddamn things were looking very so like a chicken coop. And this camp, incidentally, was a holding place for the Jewish people that were to be exterminated in. What the hell was that name of that place? I had a tip of my tongue. It's only about 10 kilometers from there, Dachau. And uh, right in there, lice. You never believe in old straw mattresses, which were all matted down and God, made out of burlap. They took us into a shower, the lousy shower. Now we heard about that. Can you imagine what our feelings were to go in that goddamn shower, take your clothes off, and go and take that shower? So we went through it. Of course, luckily we come out of it. Then they pump you some powder down your back and up your hinder, you know, and go out then you were on your own. And this was the big holding it, camp. It was a holding pen for the Jewish people that you exterminated at mm -hmm. Dachau. We found out about that later. Anyway, the conditions there were, were horrible. Food was zilch. We got one Red Cross food parcel, I think, for 18 men and raw potatoes and 
occasionally they had this ersatz coffee for you. Ersatz coffee was uh, burnt barley. They burned the barley and crack it, <coughs> make coffee out of it. And then we did a lot of walking. There wasn't enough room for everybody to really move around. That whole ball game there was nothing. To no balls or nothing. This anyway. was winter too, wasn't it? Well, this would be the first part of February. Because, you know, it, was, it wasn't warm. It was, it was cool. Not well, what was this camp like? It was, it was different from Look Three, right? Okay. This was a real pig pen. That's what it was. And of course, they had I don't know how many people were there. In there. I'd say damn near hundred thousand. They had Russians in there. They had they had everything in there. English, Australians. Americans, everything in there. It was a central point. Now, here's where the order came out from Hitler to execute all POWs. Mm. There was no order did come out. Man. Somewhere in my books there, I've got that. Uh, however, the, the German officer, they didn't go along with it. But anyway, uh, on this one particular Sunday, The 29th of April. <coughs> we had a Catholic priest in there. We had a mass outside, you know. And I'll, well, I'll go back two days. Two days, I um, they t uh, told some of us we could go out for a woodwalk to go out in the woods with a couple guards, you know, and pick up bits of wood branches and stuff and bring them to for heat or cooking or whatever want to use it for. So I went up in that damn thing. This one guard that was with me happened to be a Pol a, Pol a Polish boy. So we're just talking to him in Polish and back and forth. He says, yeah, he says, you know, he said, you can have my gun. We walked about three miles. He said, we run to the Americans. Yeah, the Americans are here. Three miles away. And I'm like, oh, damn it. You don't know how tempting that was. Mm -hmm. But there again, okay, what a mistake you wearing a different kind of uniform that they had, you know, and no white, no nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll go back. Three days, three miles, that's not not far. So when they come back in, the guy gave me his rifle, and he said, I'm going to hide in your barracks. Okay, sure. He took the damn rifle, shoved it underneath my damn mattress, and Oh, go, hey, I got a gun here. Did you guys know that? That was something different. Where did you get that? The guard gave it to me. He gave up. He surrendered to me. So. Mm -hmm. And um, then when the Americans came through, and, uh, like, right in the middle of mass, there was a big rumble out the front gate. And guess what happened? Here comes that army tank running through, coming through there. Jay, this, the priest said, God bless you boys. We're on our way home. Let's go. They all broke loose, all hell tore loose, and a lot of firing. A couple of Kriegies were pretty badly wounded, too, by the way. By friendly fire? No, no, crossfire from the, mm. from the tough Germans. And there was church fire coming from the steeple about a half a mile away. We could see the fire coming out of there. Rifle fire, machine gun, whatever it was. And all of a sudden, the damn thing just blew apart. And one of our tanks lined up on mm. it and just blasted it. And when they come into that, oh, hell tore loose, I will tell you, that was something. That's why I got this. I showed you the address of this guy on my wife's picture. That's where I got, you know, that's where I met him. That was the first time I seen him all these years, two years ago down in Dayton, Ohio, when I gave him a call. Tell me about the, uh, tell me about the, you told me about it yesterday, but I don't have it on tape. The moment of your liberation, particularly. This, this fellow who, soldier who came up. Yeah, well, that's what I'm talking yeah. about, is when, uh, of course, I, I didn't much give a damn. I was more interested in getting my German ID photo, you know. When I seen the tanks coming in there, I went up, and this one GI walked in there, looked tougher than hell, you know. I started talking to him, and I said, yeah, when the war is over, I'm going to come and visit you. Okay. It, I didn't have anything to write on except the back of my wife's picture. I did have a pencil and put his name and address on it. And I said, if I ever get to Dayton, I said, I'll give you a call. You know, 
and I completely forgot about it until we had a squadron reunion in Dayton with a bunch of us POWs, ex-POWs sitting around having a couple of drinks and bullshitting. And I said, you know what, I just happened to remember, there's a guy's address, and I think he's from Dayton, Ohio. Well, after four or five phone calls, I located him. So I invited him to for the banquet for Saturday, but he wouldn't, he didn't want to come. He said, I don't want to put in on your thing, what the hell. I had to come come in Sunday morning. So I made an announcement to all the POWs at Stalock 7A. I said, your liberator is going to be here tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Well, the front desk, they were there. All the guys come up. Mm -hmm. and we had quite a celebration. What unit was he Was he from? What, what unit liberated you? On the 14th Armored Division. I don't know what the, he was in some, he told me the infantry outfit he was with. I don't remember what it was. It was the 14th Armored Division. And um, just, I think the following day, I was sitting down there whipping up a batch of uh, whipped cream, powdered milk and margarine and sugar for make it, put a, something on our cake, our Godoyne cake. And I was sitting down there whipping it up in the bowl and there a goddamn boots comes up there and I looked up and the two pearl handle revolvers, the old General George himself. So I popped up and I saluted him and welcomed him in the camp. What are you doing, old lieutenant? I said, I'm making up some whipped cream. He stuck his finger in that bowl, took a sample and spit it out. He said, you guys been eating this shit? I said, hell, this is, this is good stuff. <laughs> then he went to the German barracks, and they found stacks and stacks of Red Cross food parcels, which was supposed to come to us. The Germans kept them. Mm. They're living high off the hall. So after that, I didn't much give a damn what happened to them, you know. So. Were quite a few of the guards, or were some of them killed during the... <clears throat> no, most of them surrendered it's to surrender. us. Yeah. A lot of the older guys, got here 40, 45 years old, you know, hell, they had a home to go to. And they just took the damn rifles and threw them at us and mingled with us. Hmm. They asked us for protection. Um, don't worry about it. The Commandant, if I remember right, he was a kind of a mean bastard, and uh, one of the PWs, I didn't see this, but this is what the story that went around camp afterwards, that um, he got a Tommy gun from one of the tankers and uh, told this German officer to head down the road. He refused. He was SS. So he gave him a squirt in the bottom of the feet, you know, get moving. You know, he started running. Then he just got down the outer range and he plugged him, dropped him. But uh, that's a story I didn't see yet, but that's what the guys were talking about. That they nailed him. Tell me, uh, excuse me, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, tell me about about the guards. What uh, what kinds of things do you remember about them? I mean, were they all pretty much alike or were they... Um, there were some decent ones and some terrible ones. What what, what would you majority of them? They were older older people, older guys. They weren't just too bad. You know, they had their orders too bad. If they got caught screwing up, that you know that didn't mean death. To them. We knew that, but majority of them were pretty decent. It's the young ones that you had to look out for. Mm -hmm. For the SS, that was another can of worms. You didn't. That were that didn't make any difference. They just didn't kill you. Look at you. Like this guy was telling me, this tanker, he said, we never took an SS man prisoner. Hmm. They never took him. They never surrendered. The only thing you can do with him is kill him. They never give up. That's that super breed, you know. No, we didn't. Uh, the other, as a rule, the guards were not too shabby there. They had whatever they found, they had a report. We knew that. A lot of them could be buffaloed real easily. How? Bribing them. Oh, bribing them. Yeah. Just give him one cigarette, and you do it. You do as I tell you. you know. That was strictly forbidden to mingle with the fraternized with the American troops. But the majority of them, like I say, they're all older people. And at the time when that march were walking along, these guys suffered as much as we did. You know, she that <laughs> they'd give you the rifle, you'd carry the rifle for. Hmm. 
But there was no, there was no chance of escape there. There was nothing. Now we'll, we'll, we're, we're going to go back to um, that after we marched out at Stalag of three, and we wound up at Springberg. Okay, there was, I don't know, maybe 25, 30, 40,000 POWs. I don't know, but they had us split up in groups. Now, Springberg was a Hitler Youth Training Center. That's all the little punk kids, eight, nine, ten years old. They got their military training there. And as we marched through there, one of them little punks was standing on each street corner. They marched us to this town. And of course our old German guards were marching alongside of us, you know. And them guys, yeah, punks were fully armed too. Anyway, they halted us for a break. And we stopped and there was an elderly woman. I say she's about eighty, in her eighties. And there was nothing supposed to cross between the ranks or between the the, the, the groups of men. And there's one punk, he hollered at her. And she kept on plodding the cross, you know. So him and this other guy from across the street, another little punk, they started beating her. They knocked her down and kicked her in all day. And six of our boys broke out of ranks to help that woman out. They walked right up and we could hear the damn uh, rifles, our uh, guard's rifles click. This guy says it's going to be a massacre. And um, they went up and picked up this old lady, escorted her across the street, and these guards with their rifles, they weren't pointed at our boys, they were pointed at those goddamn punk kids. Was they this a German her. woman? Hmm? Was this a German woman? Yeah, that old lady, mm -hmm. you know. They, uh, our boys escorted her across the street, just walked right alongside of her. And these punk kids, boy, they were, they were going apeshit about this time. And our, our guards, had rifles pointed at those kids. If those, one of those kids would have made a move towards our, one of our POWs, they would have got it. They would have, they would have shot him. They, uh, and now they, they were youth. But the SS, that was two different things. Yeah. Well, from there on, we're on our way home. What, uh, did you have any idea how much, how much weight you lost from the time you went in until you got mm, Yeah, you know, I weighed, uh, when I got shot down, I weighed 215 pounds. I know that. I come out about 160. So that's quite about a About 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed in your, in your uh, book here <coughs> that, uh, it, it seemed it seemed that you go for a while without food and then you get a whole bunch of it. Is is that pretty much, or was that just? Well, we'd have a what what okay what you could we call a bash. Yeah, yeah a bash. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was a certain special occasion, somebody's birthday or something. You know, we have a little a little extra stuff and we put out a little bit better one. But there were days when like we had full parcel of hay. It was you know, what do you say that stuff and stuff that you saved? Okay, well, uh, and, uh, whatever. When our chows started to get a little bigger, somebody's birthday, okay, let's, let's build a little more this time. Each one got a tablespoon more of food. Mm -hmm. That's what the bash was. That's what somebody's birthday or some special location or something. Were you, uh, were you hungry just about all the time? <laughs> God, we could eat all the time, you know. But yeah, we never were full. Never got a full tank. We drank a hell of a lot of water. You keep your, you know, keep your stomach full. I noticed a couple times in in your little diary there. You also said you were sick. What, what, what kind of sickness was this? Well, I don't know. How to, how to, as a person, well, maybe flu or something, yeah. you know, or intestinal flu or some damn thing. Yeah. Some that you didn't eat, or something that you did eat that you shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. I gotta go to the thing again. Once you were liberated, where where did you go from there? Where did they take you then? Well, we had a. They're going to fly us out of there. 
But the weather was bad. We laid around for two or three days waiting for the weather to clear and they do lots. Who's going to be taken out first? And I was way on the tail end. So I don't know, about ten of us, we decided we're going to hitchhike back. So we took off. We had, we had a map, of course, where to go. And we hitchhiked in GI trucks, you know, from going back. Then we'd uh, hold up somewhere with some engineer outfit or something, you know, get some chow and clothes, fresh clothes and stuff like that. It was really interesting because then we could, uh, you know, see the countryside as it, as it was. How long uh, from the time that you were liberated did you, did you start to come back? In other words, did you, for a couple of weeks, did you, did you rest and, and uh, get new clothes and things of this kind? What, what yeah. happened? Well, we'll oh, I'll get to that. Okay, we, uh, we, we hitched hike. We got into Brussels. We turned ourselves into the military authorities there with the British, okay? Then we had our IDs, our dog tags, and um, we told them what they were. So they gave us a partial payment. I don't remember what it was, maybe 50 bucks or so. We got a room in a hotel there. And that happened to be VE Day. The day the war was over. God, we went up down and I'll tell you, these Belgians are going crazy, you know. Celebrations wherever you went. Oh, God, that was fantastic. So then, um, the British got a, I went, went back to the British, British again on the ice. Says, okay, then you guys will have to go to Camp Lucky Strike, which is a big POW receiving center. They call it RAP, Retired American Military Personnel. And things are you, there are so damn many people that you'd never believe. How oh, they kept feeding these people where they got the food, I don't know. But you got through with breakfast, you'd start lining up for dinner. Because it took you that long. There was nothing to do but just a camp. So I got out early in account of my wounds, you know. Oh, I wanted to go to the hospital. Uh, they took me to the hospital to Rwanda. 159th Field Hospital. It was Yale. I was there for a whole week, you know, and there we got. I got new clothes, new uniforms, and cleaned up. Well, it made you feel like a white person mm -hmm. the first time. And then uh, I come back on the hospital on a regular ship. And we hit Staten Island, coming there, and I had a good buddy on the name of Jim Kiernan. was a cop in Brooklyn, so, yeah, let's take off and go up down. There are three of us took off. We uh, went AWOL. We got in the Staten Island Ferry, wound up in New York, and <laughs> needless to say, we had ourselves a hell of a good time. As I called the wife, as soon as I hit the hospital, I called the wife up right away. And that's why I got the news from my mother-in-law passed away, because I didn't know that. And I told her I'd be home in three, four weeks, something like that. And God, and New York was so had a good time there. And then put us on a train. We'll get you as close to hospital, as close to home as we can. That's another screwy idea. Well, you see, you guys are going to Spokane, Washington. Clear across the damn country, you know? So, God, I was madder than hell. They had some cap, poor captain in charge of that damn train, and I, the guys just drove him completely nuts. He said, I don't give a damn what you guys do, but for Christ's sake, leave me alone. I'm in charge of this train. So we stopped in Minneapolis. Train stopped in Minneapolis, fine. And there was some staff sergeant. He got off the train and got a jug of booze. <laughs> and he was sitting up here, and I said, you know, sergeant, I said, God damn it, this, this damn train is going right through my hometown. Sartell, okay. The damn train stopped off at Sartell to cool up. He's GIs threw my damn bags out. They went to the lieutenant and said, there's your bags, go get them. <laughs> Marvelous. So I went off the damn train and picked up my damn bags and walked down the main street, which is only about a block away. And there's a cab there, hey, can you give me a ride? Sure, yay. You just come back from the war. I said, yeah, I just got a prison of war camp. Where do you want to go? I said, I go to 1104 17th Avenue South, St. Cloud. My sister lives there, see? So I said, okay, fine. 
take off, get in the cab and drop me off and back at the house. I say, how much owe you? Nothing. It's been a year alone, he nothing. But I give him a dollar bill anyway. My sister was out in the garden holding the corn. <laughs> God, I yelled at her, what the hell are you doing back there, barefooted yet? Zoom! He grabbed me down and just about squashed me to death. I uh, jumped in the Model A Ford. Got to go out to my parents' place. So they stopped, and it was the first time in my life to see my mother and my dad hold hands. Hmm. When I walked, I locked up that damn door, door that door. I said, we stayed there for a little while, and of course she lived with her dad at the time, out towards Holy Ford. Get in the car and drive out there. Reef. But I had to be in, in Spokane. Two days later, the train was supposed to get there. So we stayed home. And, and her and I, we got in the damn bus. We beat the train over there. <laughs> when that train got there, there was nobody on it. They all took off. Yeah. They just flew to coop. So I come in the hospital and turned myself in. I, said, I was supposed to be on this train. I said, I was going, that train isn't here yet. He says, but I he says, here from Foley, 40 I says, I'm from Foley. It's a whack from Foley. Hmm. So she checked me in. She says, I'll check you in tomorrow. So don't get, the records don't get goofed up that you went AWOL. But we didn't care. No, I didn't do much good, damn. Well, my lighter. I keep stealing your lighter. Here we go. Why, oh, you crooked. That's you. right. <laughs> it's an automatic thing. I put a lighter and I put it in my pocket. <clears throat> was it was it hard um, readjusting the civilian life for you? Yeah, it was. Absolutely. What kind of problems? Things change. Well, I had a real antagonistic attitude, you know. Somebody like, well, this one deal that, I'm glad I did it. This one deal I went to church. Well, when I come home, my mother was telling me about this one guy, he was a pro-Nazi, you know, and he told my mother, after the notice came out that I was missing, he comes up and tells my mother, it's a good thing that I shot down, he didn't have no business going over there. He was strictly German, I'll tell you. Of course, you know how my mother would feel about something like that. And, well, well what the hell, what the hell's the difference? And other people come up, don't be the same damn thing. So I went to church on Sunday morning, and all of a sudden, bam, it hit me. And I seen that guy coming out of that church. <coughs> I had him by the throat, and I just beat the living hell out of him, knocked him down the steps, and his kids come up and help. Of course, my kid brothers took care of the kids. So, uh, anyway, across the street was a 3-2 joint. A couple, a couple guys invited Come on, Frank, have a beer with us. Fine. Here, this guy comes in, in there again. You got the same damn treatment. I right, beat the hell out of him again. And uh, then we went over, stayed with her dad's place out there. And the next one, Monday morning, here comes the sheriff, Stearns County. Frank, I got a warrant for your arrest, assault and battery. He told him what happened. He said, ah, oh, shit, he said, Frank, don't worry about it. Well, you come in too tomorrow, you'll see the judge anyway, you know. But I cleared up, so I told my dad about it, so my dad got a hold of Harry Burns. I don't even remember Harry, Harry Burns. Burns Law Firm here in St. Yeah, Cloud? He just, he just died here not too long ago. He was a pretty old man. He was a World War I veteran, so was a judge. <laughs> so, Harry, oh God, this is really a dandy. He put him on the, this guy, the witness stand, he had him talking half German and half English, and the judge sitting there smirking and laughing. And he said, well, it's about time to throw this thing, get this thing out of the way, he threw it out of court. And he said, you, Mr. So-and-so, don't you ever make a statement like that about one of our people again? Threw it out of court. God, they wrapped his mailbox in black and everything mm -hmm. out of the water. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was rough. You, you uh, quick on the trigger. I never... Never was like that before, you know. Quick-tempered, you mean? Yeah. It really, it's, it changes you. It changed it. Still, still hasn't corrected itself. I don't think it ever will. Did you have nightmares and things of that we kind afterwards? Rip sheets and that. Yeah. Wake up at night screaming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not the same. But I'm still here. And they have a lot of guys that aren't. 
Do you have any uh, any resentments about your World War II experience? You, about guess, the whole deal? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't never, ever want to go through it again, but I wouldn't take a million bucks for it, for the experience. And like these POWs over there now, I know what they're going through. In fact, they're probably treated just like the Japanese treated our people over there. I imagine it'd be the same thing. The Germans were half human, but them SOBs there, I don't think they are. Like the pictures they had on television, you know they were beaten. They don't, you take a soldier or sailor, whatever they were, they ain't gonna, they're not going to go up and say, hey, we shouldn't have done this. They were told to do that with, or else. And you can tell the way they talk. There was nothing, hey, we shouldn't have done it, you know. They just, one word at a time, you know what's wrong. Like in, they had, I don't know what the hell story it was, they had, the guy was blinking in, in uh, Morse code, you know, mm -hmm. under duress or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People caught that. What impact, what effects do you think your war experience had upon you as a person? How do you think the war affected you as, as a man, as a, as a husband? Uh, what general impact do you think the war had on your life? You know, that's, it's hard to explain. Like I say, quick temper. Didn't much give a damn for nothing. A lot of worry all the time. I never worried before in my life. Mm. But it was gone, it was gone. I don't know, it's just totally different. And um, another thing too, if <coughs> these protesters there, I could literally go in there with a blowtorch and burn their butts right off. You know, you feel so strongly about something. And uh, I worked with the kids with Sons of American Legion. I had those kids. They, taught, they were taught everything about the American flag. Mm. A lot of and, and this stuff stays with those kids. It's it's hard to tell. I love my country. We probably don't have the best damn government, but by God, it's the best there is. It's 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 hard to tell, you know, what your feelings are, or what has happened. She can tell you more about that than I can, because she seemed to change. Were you, um, did you have a sense of bitterness? Towards the Germans? No, toward, toward the guys here, who, around here, who didn't go to the service, or? I think about it, yeah, I really do. I know guys that were uh, deferred for one reason or just some stupid thing, you know. Some guys will tell you, hey, you didn't have any, what the hell, you had it good over there, you come back. Well, we never had it good, you know. Yeah, what breaks the hell out of me the most is, okay, you get these guys that probably went in service or in the reserves. I did at that time. Guys in the service and never seen any action or anything, you know, and hey, they were big shots, big wheels, hey, that, that, that hurts the hell out of me. Did you did you have a worst experience as a prisoner of war? And could you could you think of one and, and tell me about it? Was there really something that stands out in your mind as being the absolute pits, as it were, um, your your lowest point, as it were, as a as a POW? Or was it just kind of misery most of the time? Well, I think interrogation was the worst worst part of it because you know they you're there by yourself and you just would talk to anybody or someone to talk to it was this big item you talk to yourself and you start asking yourself questions and answering then you're in trouble but uh this one time they did throw in a gi in with me you know a sergeant they treated him rough they just threw him in a damn cell and, you know, this guy was big <laughs> started swearing and, you know, 
and I started talking a little bit, okay, don't worry, we'll be out of this, everything's going to be okay, and, uh, and we started talking, and I said, God, what town, uh, where are you from? He said, I'm in Texas. Okay, uh, what, uh, what town in Texas? Because that's not, I was in Texas. I'm from Houston. Houston, uh, Bingo. Yeah. Yeah. They pulled that stuff a lot. I think that was the most depressing time. Well, of course, the whole damn thing was not a picnic, but another bad one was uh, that march, that black, what do you call the black march, at 20 below zero weather and very few, a lot of frostbitten toes in there. How long did that last? Two days and two nights. That was, I think that was the worst part of it. And then, of course, when we hit the lousing showers, we knew what went on there prior to that. Oh, the whole thing was uh, pretty much. Did you, uh, one thing that I've always wondered about this is when a bunch of men are thrown together under a condition like that in a prison camp, does tension and, and the animosity develop among the guys? I mean, is, is there, did you notice any uh, fights or this kind of thing? Well, there'd be, I would say there'd be disagreements, but no, no, they, we, we got along, we had to get along together, we knew that. God, yeah, I knew my buddy's history, you know, mm -hmm. well as he did his, mm -hmm. we talked, and we, we knew our feelings. Occasionally you'd get a guy again in there, like we had one that was... No thanks. Uh, well to do family, he was kicking his weight around. But it didn't take him long to realize, hey, it's enough of this, you know. His sister was a, I don't know, some sister of a movie star or some damn thing over there. And he was, uh, but he cooled down in the hell of a hurry. Mm -hmm. Oh, we had one guy that went to uh, MIT, sharp kid. He was a B-17 pilot. But he was sharp kid. And that's all that guy talked about was women. Hmm. Women, what he's going to do to the women and all that stuff when he got back, I'll tell you. We had some mixed emotions about that bird. <laughs> but after he came back, he joined the ministry. Hmm. And he was down in Brazil for 15 years as a minister. Hmm. And I heard, heard about that. He wrote, sent me a letter telling me what he was. I just couldn't damn believe it. Hmm. The... Uh, because he was really, that's all he talked about was about going to bed with some broad or mm. something, and he just turned mm. a complete turnaround. Did you see any any uh, instances of uh, among the POWs of, of collaboration with the Germans? Was there was was there an element of that? Did some guys do that? Tried to not not to my knowledge. Of course, it possibly could have happened because he would have been treated better, or, you know, had a little bit more. But mm -hmm. no, not, not, Never saw not in our barracks. No, I didn't see any of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen people bargaining with Germans, you know, a couple of packs, of, a couple of cigarettes for something, okay, like this radio that mm -hmm. we got. I was all brought in by that, but I was, he was doing that for a reason. But as, as far as that, there was no collaboration because they wouldn't last for long. They would have been spotted right away. That, there was none of that to my knowledge, because he didn't eat, and nobody ate any better than we did, no. There was nothing there. Did your, did your prison camp experience have any, any long-term effects on your health, do you think? We all did. Is that right? Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh boy, they claim that. Cardiovascular problems, there was none of that, but that's where I'll develop. Mm -hmm. All through stress, we know that. And this uh, post-trauma syndrome, Mm -hmm. A lot of that, a lot of that, which affect, it, it can affect your entire body. Now, I don't know if you, you should get that XBLW bulletin. You should subscribe to that. I think I probably will. It'll, uh, mm -hmm. It tells you all about the different types of diseases that the people did pick up. I talked with a man here in, in, uh, in Little Falls who claimed he had uh, he had bowel problems, still has bowel yeah. problems. Mm -hmm. But what is the guy's name? Schumacher. Oh, John Schumacher. John Schumacher, yeah. I know him, yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's 
that's all relevant to this thing. Mm -hmm. Do you, just a last question, I know you've got people coming. That's okay. Um, <clears throat> Were you well taken care of after you got back home? In other words, with VA and and uh, this kind of thing, did you think the government looked after you as as a as a POW, as a veteran uh, <coughs> since the war? Well, I was in a hospital in Cleveland, Cryo General Hospital. How long was I there, Mother? Damn near a year. They treated us real good. Was this a process of just getting you back to health again, feeding yeah. you and rest and this kind of thing? Or? Well, no, that was uh, plastic surgery. Oh, plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. I had twice. I had it twice. I was done twice. With your hands? Mm -hmm. And um, the VA has been damn good. So we get POWs, especially here, they get special treatment. Well, Swift, Dr. Swift is in there and uh, Aunt Trevella. We get, we get special treatment there. Like all my heart medication and stuff, I get it all through the VA. It won't cost me anything. That's a BOW. My glasses don't work. They treat us good. We probably don't have the best damn doctors in the world here, but they do what they can do. I promise this is the last question that just came to me. If you could talk to one of the POWs now over in, over in uh, Iraq, what would you want to tell him? Have faith, you know. Those guys there, they're, they're about the same as we were, you know. They, they'll find their own way. They know, they know what to do. They, there's one thing that these people there now, and through the experience of POWs in World War II, Korea and Vietnam, these p people know what goes on in POWs, and they're briefed on it. They're told what to expect. We weren't. All they told us, say, name, rank, and serial number, and that's it. But these people know what the hell to expect. And I'm sure they're going to fare okay, either way. Because you don't break an American that easy.